Hi, I'm James Conner, and thank you for joining us for our virtual uranium conference. Uranium was the top performing commodity in 2023, up an astonishing 80%, and this is being driven by government policy, supply shocks, and geopolitics. At the UN Climate Change Conference, 24 countries backed a declaration calling for the tripling of global nuclear energy capacity by 2050. The other big driver of the uranium price is supply shocks coming from the world's two largest producers. Both Kazataprom and Camago have cut production due to unforeseen complications. In addition, numerous geopolitical issues add uncertainty to uranium production and delivery, including the ongoing war in Ukraine, looming sanctions against Russia, a coup in Niger, and shipping disruptions in the Red Sea. So where is the uranium price going in 2024 and is it too late to buy and has the uranium price gotten ahead of itself? To answer these questions, we've assembled some of the smartest people within the uranium sector. Our first speaker is our conference sponsor, John Chapegli of Sprott Inc. Other expert speakers include Rick Rule of Rural Investment Media, Curtis Hines of TAM International, Justin Hewen of Uranium Insider, and Jonathan Hines of UXC. Company speakers include Ross McElroy of Vision Uranium, Bill Williams of ISO Energy, Dastin Kosherbayev of Kazataprom, Lee Courier of NextGen Energy, Jordan Trimble of Sky Harbor Resources, and we conclude with Kirk Snobellin of Urenco. We also want to give a shout out to John Quakes, who's a great resource for information on X, and if you're not a follower, I encourage you to check out his X account at Quakes99. As a reminder, we're gonna have an open chat on the right-hand side of the screen. Please say hello, make a comment, or ask a question. We're also gonna be running polls throughout the conference, so keep an eye out for those. As you know, this conference is free for all attendees, but it takes a lot of time and effort. There are three other people besides me that help create this content, including a graphics designer, a video editor, and also someone who manages all the social media accounts. So we have one big ask. Subscribe to our channel, Bloor Street Capital. You can also hit that notification button to be kept updated on our future events and also give us a like and leave a comment. And you can follow us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Thank you for your support and I hope you enjoy the conference. Hi, John, and thank you very much for joining us today. 2023 was a breakout year for uranium with much of that move coming in the last few months of the year. And I always like to start our conversations the same way to get an update on the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. When you and your team took it over in July of 2021, the NAV was only 600 million, 18 million pounds of uranium. Where is it now? Yeah, hey, Jimmy, good to see you. Um, it's, it's hard to believe that we're two and a half years uh, into the life of our, our of SPUT, and um, we're about 6.7 billion. So the fund has grown by a multiple of about 10. And I think even more interesting is it's now SPUT's single largest fund, which is uh, pretty astonishing. So we're we're obviously very pleased. The fund recently was at all time highs. Uh, I think it's fair to say our, our investors are very pleased with the performance. Um, and you know we have some investors that were very early uh, in this trade and. Some of them are up 3X on their money, which has been great. So that's an interesting point. It's your single largest fund now, so that means it overtook the gold fund. Yeah, and the interesting thing is, obviously, the gold fund's been around since 2010, um, and the gold fund is, is very near and dear to our heart, but uranium has really been the, the star of the last uh, 12 months or so uh, with you know an 89% gain last year. and you know, only partway through January, the fund is up another 15%. So the momentum continues. Uh, there's lots of uh, lots of interest, growing interest uh, for sure. People are very curious about you know why this particular commodity is doing so well when many other commodities are hitting multi-year multi-year lows. And uh, we've been incredibly busy in terms of engaging with institutional investors uh, over the last five or six weeks. Uh, and I just came back from from Europe where I traveled to. London, Milan, and Zurich, and, and met with 36 different uh, funds there that are, some of them are, are learning about uranium, some of them are existing investors in the sector and wanted updates. And uh, there's still a lot of interest and in, in excitement, even though we've hit 100 bucks. And you know, you would think, well, you know, the price has hit 100 bucks. Surely people are taking profits and moving on, or they think they've missed it. 
I would say it's it's very different. Um, as the price goes up, it really helps to validate the thesis. It, as the price has gone up, it also has made the sector more investable in terms of size and liquidity. Um, and I think the reality is there's always more momentum-oriented investors in the world than value investing, which is obviously very difficult to be contrarian, particularly when sectors are, are deeply out of favor, like uranium was, you know, from 2011 right through to, to 2020. I do want to ask you about that marketing trip, but before we do that, I want to continue on with uh, a discussion on the flows. And so a lot of money has flown into the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. What about the Uranium Miners ETF or URNM? Yeah, well, we've seen a really interesting rotation uh, with our business, uh, specifically with respect to uh, a disproportionate share of inflows have actually gone into our uranium mining ETFs over the last six months. Uh, that's a really healthy sign because it, it basically reflects, I think, growing interest in the space. It also reflects uh, institutional investors and retail investors that are more willing to get exposed to the, to the miners, which we know are more volatile and less liquid, but do provide a lot of that operating leverage for the producers and, and near-term producers, as well as optionality uh, for, for a lot of the developers and explorers. So, um, we've seen this kind of shift back to the miners. Remember, the miners really got ahead of themselves uh, in the fourth quarter of, of 2021. That's when kind of the Reddit mob kind of got a hold of the uranium story and pushed a lot of those stocks to, to levels uh, that were, were not sustainable. And over that period, you know, the commodity price kept marching higher and the stocks kind of did not keep pace. But we, see, we saw this rotation starting to emerge in July of last year where the uranium stocks started to perform better, and as a result, we've seen larger flows into our uranium mining ETFs around the world than we've had in the physical uranium trust, which is three times the size. So I think that's a very good indication that interest is, is broadening back to the equities, and it's not just one stock, uh, because we know last year a lot of those gains was driven by a single name. We've definitely seen a widening of interest and a, and a, a greater breadth of performance across the, the small and mid-cap names in the space. That's an interesting point because even though the, the spot is making uh, new highs or you know multi-year highs, the a lot of the equities are not factoring in this higher spot price. So you're, you're seeing a closing of that valuation gap? Yeah, we've definitely seen better relative performance from the miners um, and not, and as I said, not just one name, but greater breadth of performance and that is obviously, I, I think, helping to encourage more capital flows into those products. Um, our uranium mining ETF is, is uh, about 1.8, 1.9 billion right now. Um, and our junior fund is around 250 million. And our European version of our uranium mining fund has broken through 300. So uh, somebody recently told me that Sprott, when you add up all of our exposure in uranium mining ETFs, that we're the single largest holder of uranium mining stocks in the world, which I had no idea about. But um, so we now have the largest physical uranium trust, and now we and we have uh, the most exposure to uranium mining stocks in the world. So it's it, pretty impressive. I think it's about nine billion U.S. dollars altogether. So I want to move on now and discuss the the spot market. There's a lot of tightness, or there appears to be a lot of tightness just due to geopolitical concerns and also supply disruptions coming, coming out of Kazataprom and also Cameco. What are you seeing? What are you hearing? Yeah, well, I think it really kicked off um, in August. That, that's when we saw the, 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 the I think, the, the most recent inflection point. And, and that's when the price kind of broke out of this range that we were, we were in, in around the mid-50s per pound. Um, and we know we started off September at $60 and everybody was kind of scratching their head saying, you know, why, why was the price so firm in, in the month of August, which is typically very quiet. And, you know, we started to, to, to find the reasons why when, when Cameco signaled they were having some, some, some short-term production issues at mine and mill. Um, and obviously the, the momentum carried through right through to the fall. You know, we hit $72 and people, might say, well, what's the significance of $72? Well, it was the price of uranium right before the earthquake and tsunami in Japan in 2011. So when we broke that, that threshold, you know, that was finally getting through another psychological barrier for investors. And it wasn't too far 
uh, after that that the Kazakhs announced that they were going to flex up production in both 24 and 25. And we saw the price of uranium fall $5 a pound very quickly, back to $67. But within a week or so, it was like right through 72 again. I think that reflects a couple things. One, there was some skepticism in the market whether they can actually achieve that. And obviously, in the last couple of weeks, we've got some, some, some confirmation from them that they are probably not going to hit their number. And we've also had very strong underlying demand. We see utilities back in the spot market last year. We've seen producers in the spot market last year. You know, we were in the spot market, albeit at a much further reduced level than the two prior years. I think it's very important to remind uh, the audience that, you know, last year we bought 4 million pounds of uranium, which is really not a whole lot of material, and yet the price went up 89%. So who's who's really driving the price? Well, it's end users, uh, in our, our belief, in both the spot market buying what they could find, and obviously the term market, had a very substantial year. But if you, you know, pull back the layers of the term market last year, you know, it was about 160 odd million pounds were contracted. But when you pull out what the Ukrainians purchased, which is 60 odd million pounds, I think the rest of the industry is still not at replacement rate contracting. So we still think there's more room for, this, for the uh, long-term contracting cycle to accelerate particularly amongst U.S. utilities who have been dragging their feet in terms of buying more uranium. We don't know why. Um, the European utilities have been more proactive, and uh, we think this year is going to be kind of a catch-up year for U.S. utilities to, to buy more. You mentioned that in 2023, Sprott only purchased 4 million pounds. Can you put that into perspective for us? What, how does that compare to 2022? Yeah, sure. So in, in 22, I think we purchased uh, approximately 20 million pounds. So um, it was just a fraction. And, you know, what's interesting to me uh, also to note is, you know, we had the we had spot go up 82 percent last year in performance. Yet the total flows for the entire year were 400 million dollars. You know, I'm not going to belittle 400 million dollars, but in the grand scheme of asset flows around the world, it's really a drop in the bucket for an asset that went up 82 percent in a year where returns were very hard to find. So I think it, it's reflective of, we're still at a stage where we don't have investors trampling over themselves to get in, in, in position in the sector. We still do not have the big journalist money there. We still have, you know, kind of the small and mid-sized institutions that I think, you know, have been the most proactive in terms of getting position the last three years. Um, and, and that's another reason why I don't think the, the trade is crowded by any means, because we have not seen, you know, a wave of new capital come in, into the sector relative to other asset classes. And so that's a good overview of what you're seeing and hearing in the, the spot market. What about the contracting market? Can you give any insights on that? Yeah, I think I think this year um, we're hopeful anyways that, that we break through the 160 mark. I think ultimately what everybody is, is, is expecting that over the next few years, that the contracting cycle will continue, it'll be, it'll be very healthy, and that we really need to get back to levels where utilities are buying you know, 200 million pounds and above, which is really indicative of them reloading inventories and then building, you know, restocking uh, future fuel supplies. We're not there yet, we're, we're just kind of treading water if you look at the last cycle in the mid 2000s, there were years where the industry was buying upwards of 250 million pounds per year on long term contracts. That obviously collapsed um, after 2011 and averaged about 70 million pounds per annum over a 10 year period. Um, and so, you know, that's a period of destocking. And I think what's happening, what's why we've gone from kind of 70 to 120 to 160 million pounds is just a, a function of time. Uh, inventories have drawn down. Um, it's just natural for utilities to draw down inventory over time as they consume it. Second of all, I think there's a change in mindset that now security of supply is becoming more important because of potential supply disruptions, because you know some producers are having issues in terms of restarting mines or expanding existing ones. Obviously, there's still this lingering concerns about you know, potential geopolitics and, and, and trade wars and whatnot, uh, further entangling or complicating the, 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 the nuclear fuel supply chain. There's obviously a bill that's waiting to get approved in the U.S. Senate that could 
uh, ban the importation of Russian enriched uranium uh, but, uh, and, and, and allow for a certain waiver process for the next few years. But there's a lot of uncertainty around how that is going to operate, the time, the, the, the waiver process, and then the wild card is always, will the Russians retaliate and cut the West off from enriched uranium before the, uh, the hard deadline of uh, December 31st, 2027. So I think all of these things have changed the psychology and the mindset of the fuel buyers. They're very focused on ensuring they have long-term supply. I think it's pretty well known in the industry that the top producers have essentially sold out all their production for the, for, for the next few years. I think if I was a fuel buyer and I called some of the largest producers and I get a response that, hey, I'm sold out for the next four years, wouldn't make me feel like we're in a, we remain in a period of, bl of plentiful supply, which they have become incredibly accustomed to for the greater part of the last 10 years as we were re, you know, working down a lot of excess inventory. So I think the psychology has changed. You know, at the end of the day, the fundamentals haven't changed at all because we knew there was a supply gap three years ago, five years ago, and today. So what's changed? Well, it's, I think it's the mindset more than anything, the psychology of the market. You raise an interesting point there about Russia and whether or not they might use the leverage that they have because they're they're so big into enrichment and conversion services, and that's an interesting point. If they were to weaponize that and in, in the impact it would have on the markets. Yeah, and I think it's it's something obviously nobody is 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 wanting to play out because it will be uh, disruptive, and the sector has been faced with a, a number of challenges since the war broke out. But if if that were to play out, obviously you just don't know because it's going to be a very um, psychologically driven event, but it, it could create a short-term calamity in the market. Uh, we obviously think it would it would spike the price of U308. Uh, again, we're not predicting it, but it's something that we everybody's watching for. Interesting points. So let's talk about your marketing trip to Europe that you uh, you mentioned or you touched on earlier. You went to three cities and you saw 36 clients. Yeah, we uh, we just spent a, a week. Uh, we were hosted. Uh, by a bank, and uh, they, they brought us around uh, in London and Milan and Zurich. Uh, you know, London for sure, um, they're very up to speed with, with the uranium. Um, Continental Europe, I would say, is, is further behind in terms of their understanding and their, their positioning in the sector. So we tend to do more, uh, you know, kind of education and, and, and um, kind of research, uh, help them through their research process. But, you know, there's I think you know the fundamentals are very appealing, they're very interesting, but there's also this stigma, uh, this legacy stigma about investing in the sector is clearly fading away. It's not universal. There are still pockets in continental Europe that are still, a, we, we're not allowed to invest in this sector, which I think is very antiquated and unfortunate, but you're, you, you know, we're just not getting the, the same kind of resistance that we would, that we would typically see you know, two or three years ago in terms of you know, is this a safe sector to invest in? Can I, you know, is it is it morally right to invest in the sector? I mean, I think attitudes are changing enormously. COP28, you know, the pledge by 20 plus countries to triple nuclear power, I think goes a long way in terms of reducing that stigma and, and, and getting past that legacy that we have with nuclear energy. Yeah, and, and I think a big part of it too is if you have a mandate to make money and this commodity is up 80 or 90 percent and every other commodity is down on the year, you pretty well have to be there. Yeah, I think it's very hard to ignore. Um, people are looking for new investment ideas. This is this is something that I think is very unique. It fits a, in a whole bunch of different thematics for people. So it can fit within a decarbonization kind of trend. It can fit in an energy and energy security theme. Um, it is obviously uh, the ideal complement to renewable energy, which most people have been invested in for the last 10 years, more downstream renewable energy. And that's had a really challenging uh, year or so. People have uh, not done well with those investments. So I think, you know, it fits in a whole bunch of different buckets. And maybe you can provide some more color on the, the meetings that you had. Were these long only clients? Were they hedge funds, retail, institutional? And are they new to the space or are they uh, well acquainted with the space? Yeah, it was a really wide variety. Um, and I think that's reflective of the growing interest in the, in the space. I would say over the last six months, we've had much uh, greater 
a number of inquiries from generalist investors. Um, they're, they're clearly doing their homework on the space and trying to figure out how this fits into their portfolio. But it's everything from family offices to small kind of boutique funds to very large, you know, um, particular funds within very large asset managers. But it is not the Black Rocks of the world. They're not calling and saying, hey, we've got billions of dollars to deploy in this space. It's, they're just not there yet. Um, the sector is obviously growing nicely. It's recapitalizing. Um, it's becoming more liquidity. And, you know, with, with, with all of these um, asset classes, you know, liquidity begets liquidity. So we've been very focused on growing the vehicles because we know that's a key requirement to get more and more institutional participation. You know, it, it wouldn't, it, it wasn't uncommon to talk to institutions in Europe that said, look, we're not allowed to invest in anything under a $5 billion market cap. So when you think about that in the context of the uranium sector, you pretty much eliminated all but three or four things. So it's a pretty limited um, investment universe for some of these funds, but they'll come, you know, they will come in due course um, as the sector grows. But, you know, look, there's lots of capital out there. Uh, we remain very, very focused on educating the market about the sector uh, and helping investors understand how it works. John, before we wrap it up, I want to touch on a few other uh, news events that happened at Sprott, one of which was you were contemplating a redemption feature and you decided to not do that. Maybe you can provide the rationale for why you took that course. Yeah, sure. So in uh, September, we announced publicly that we were contemplating a limited redemption feature for the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. You know, we were not happy with the way it was trading. We obviously hit some air pockets in a period in the summer where liquidity and market sentiment in general across the markets was soft. And so it was something we were entertaining. We collected feedback from a lot of institutions, and that was in September when the price was $60 a pound. Now, fast forward to the end of December, the price had kind of broken through 80 and, and working towards 90. And we just reflected on what's the likelihood that shareholders actually approve a proposal like this, which has a very high threshold. Two thirds of all the shares outstanding of the trust would actually have to vote and approve such a proposal. We think that's a very high hurdle to achieve given the change in the market dynamics and clearly the change in sentiment. So it's something we've decided to put on the back burner for now. That doesn't mean we won't uh, revisit it in the future if market conditions change. But for the time being, we have such a busy schedule at Sprott for the next six months in terms of events, conferences, and requests. We really want to focus all of our energy on that while the sector is, is, is really moving to the next stage of this bull market and not get distracted with a very cumbersome and expensive proxy process. Understood. And Sprott recently filed a $1.5 billion shelf. Maybe you can give us some color on that. Yeah, so we also announced in early January that we, we came to an agreement with our regulator. We renewed our shelf um, prospectus for one and a half billion US dollars. We then drew a billion of the billion and a half down off the shelf, so to speak, for the at the market uh, capital raising program. We've raised about 55 million uh, U.S. dollars so far, and um, that program will last for 25 months. We've also made an agreement with our regulator that we would not purchase more than 9 million pounds of uranium in the spot market for the next two calendar years. This was a compromise to allow us to continue to operate the trust and to grow it while not, you know, overly overwhelming, let's say, the spot market in terms of our purchases. So we think this was a very fair compromise. Uh, gives us certainty and clarity around around how much capacity we have to work with. And to be totally candid, I think it's going to be very challenging even to find 9 million pounds in this market right now. And I'm sorry, I just want to clarify that. 9 million pounds in one year? Per calendar year. Correct. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. And is there anything else you want to highlight before we wrap it up? No, I would just say that... Um, you know, that even though the, 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 the price is broken out to $100, I, I still think and we still think that there's a lot of opportunity here because we look at the, the, the supply deficit that the industry needs to solve for. And whether you take the base case or the more aggressive scenario, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of one and a half billion to 2.3 billion pounds 
of uncovered requirements that utilities have between now and 2040. The only way you solve for that is you need to basically double production globally between now and 2040, which is going to be a huge undertaking and is going to require very robust uh, uranium prices, not just for three months or six months and then it goes back to some other level. It's going to have to stay elevated for a very long period of time because of the, the, the long lead times and the large capex that's required to basically get these projects built. So we're very we're very optimistic that the prices are going to remain elevated for a, a, you know an extended period of time. We don't really see a catalyst that can knock this back. Uh, the world is clearly pivoted back to nuclear energy in most countries, um, and it's going to require massive investments as uh, as we want if we want to focus on these primary goals of decarbonization, energy security, and reliable baseload power to offset intermittency of renewables. These are the three fundamental drivers of why uh, energy policy has shifted back to nuclear energy. Great comments. And John, I want to thank you very much for spending time with us today. If someone would like to learn more about Sprott and its various products, where can they go? Yeah, so Sprott.com is probably the easiest point to start. We've got information about our funds. We've got a really great investor education section, which I would encourage people to spend some time reading reading about reading our reports um, we published a report in early january that i think is very timely we also published some really great podcasts with expert speakers in the sector um, and that will help you you know get a very good understanding of, of how the sector works um, and we have a, a, a number of funds that you can kind of explore and, and understand well that's great once again thanks very much john thank you for having me always nice to talk to you Hi, I hope you're enjoying the conference. Just a reminder to subscribe to our channel, Bloor Street Capital. Give us a like and leave a comment. Thanks for your support. Hi, Ross, and thank you very much for joining us today. You and your team achieved a number of milestones in 2023, including the completion of the feasibility study on the triple R deposit. And I want to start right here by just reviewing the results from that study. And maybe you can just give us a brief highlight of that study, touching on the CapEx, the NPV, and also the internal rate of return. Sure, I can. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you, Jimmy, and, and uh, able to, to have this discussion. Um, no, I mean, it was, a, it was a very big milestone for fission uranium last year, completing the feasibility study. That was... Uh, basically filed uh, in February last year. So it's, you know, still less than a year old. Um, I think we, what, what it showed uh, was this was an extremely viable uh, uh, operation, you know, future operation. Uh, uh, you know, by the way, we used $65 uranium, which was forward looking, uh, you know, when, when we were completing the study in, in January, February last year, $65 uranium was still, you know, uh, somewhere in the future, well, we far surpass that. But basically, all of the the underlying uh, economics are, are just so much uh, even even vastly improved. But it really showed, um, you know, uh, uh, this to be the the triple R deposit to be one of the lowest operating cost uranium operations out there. You know, will be. Um, you know, just sub ten dollar a pound. Uh, U.S. Uh, for for operations, um, that's that's good, uh, and, and all in sustaining costs of, of just under 14 U.S. So 18 Canadian, 14 U.S. on the all in sustaining. That tells you there's some tremendous margins. Uh, you know, with, with given the price of uranium at $100, so you can see where that can go. But we outlined a, just a, a 10 year mine life. Um, and averaging just over 9 million pounds of uranium a year. So low cost, uh, high volume, um, you know, it's, it's gonna be a tremendous asset. And, and by the way, the, the underlying uh, economics, I guess at, at that $65 price uranium, at the time we looked at after tax NPV of around $1.2 billion. Uh, and IR of what was 27% then, uh, 
after tax. So, you know, it, it looks really healthy. And as I said, with, with the current uranium prices, it's it, it's phenomenally vastly improved even since then. Yes, I'm glad you mentioned the fact that it was the study was done at $65 uranium. It's amazing how much has changed in the past year. But you mentioned that the CapEx is 1.1 billion Canadian. How will you fund this? Sure, yeah, uh, 1.15 billion Canadian um, and looking at uh, about a two and a half year payback on that, um, on that CapEx. Um, how does it get funded? Well, uh, you know, I mean, it's still a little ways out for us yet to uh, to have it fully mapped out, but I mean, there will be a, a lot of components, I think, to do that that that, that uh, goes in. I, certainly, the majority of it, it right at this point looks to be debt financed. Um, uh, there will be, I'm sure, a component to, of equity to it as well. So maybe a 70-30 type split ratio. But you know, there's also um, other things that we would want, maybe possibly consider um, bringing in a strategic partner to help, uh, you know, somebody with uh, possibly mining experience. Um, uh, but, but you know, a, a, a strategic partner in, into the into the deal to be able to uh, help with the financing. Um, and then, you know, we'll see. You know, there's there's a possibility too. You would you would think on on some. Uh, some sort of sales opportunities with, uh, you know, contracts with with utilities, and I'm and I'm not talking about locking in prices. You know, we obviously want to be able to take advantage of higher uranium prices, but I think that, you know, as you get closer to mine financing, I, I'm pretty sure that the lenders would want to see um, visibility, uh, you know, with with who it is that we're actually selling uranium to, and and get some sort of an idea of what those prices would be. So. I see all those kind of components being in there. There's uh, also the opportunities for streaming royalty. Um, right now, we're a hundred percent owned project, so we've got a great deal of flexibility in what we can do um, with respect to financing. And your deposit has many advantages, um, one of which is it's located along the same geological corridor as next gens, which is the Patterson Lake corridor. And maybe you can just touch on that and how close are these two deposits? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Patterson Lake corridor is a long geologic trend. It's, uh, what would it be, something in the order of 500 meters across from north to south. It's an east-west east -west, uh, trending corridor, um, and it's, it's several kilometers long. And you're right, it is extremely prolific. We have two world-class deposits sitting... Uh, you know, three to four kilometers apart from each other, next gen's arrow, um, and then of course Vision's PLS property, uh, very, very close. It's the same geology, the same trend, um, you know, there, uh, and then of course, if you go the other way, it's also encouraging to see what's happening on the Patterson Lake corridor on, on Cameco, uh, Arano, um, joint venture land, they, they have a, uh, a showing called the Spitfire, which uh, also has some high grade drill intercepts, but it really tells you just the potential that, that's out there uh, in the Patterson Lake corridor to host uh, you know, world-class ore bodies. And I think there's plenty more yet to be discovered. So, um, you know, which, which is also, I think at some point, you know, in this discussion, we can talk how meaningful that'll be into our exploration program too, because we think that the Patterson Lake corridor has so much upside. Yes, it has two uh, two projects already in the advanced development stage there, but I think that the opportunities are, are ripe to find more. So yeah, there are two projects very close together, um, uh, and you know, and, and both looking to be you know very low cost operations. So you know, these these will be I think without uh, you know too much of a stretch uh, forward looking statement. I think these are going to be the next. Uh, major deposits to be developed in, in the Athabasca Basin, what we're seeing out in the southwest side of the, the province. So having said all that, a large part of your capex is for the construction of a mill, which is approximately $350 million. And if you do not build a mill, your capex will be significantly lower. And this is something that you've considered. And when I ask this, I'm making the assumption that you might have access to next gen's mill, given the fact that they're much further along the permitting process. Than you are. 
Yeah, I, I mean, the, I, I, the two projects are, are really both advancing along, you know, somewhat similar timelines. Like next gen are about a year, you know, somewhere between just over a year uh, difference ahead of, of vision on the on the permitting aspect. I think we're shorter to production um, timeline once you're in development than there. So I, I see the two projects coming on stream, you know, at very, very similar times. Um, and you're right to note, you know, in our feasibility study, what, what we've done is shown this as a standalone project. These are all the economics based on a standalone project. That means us building our own mill uh, and, and all the infrastructure associated with that. And really the same, you know, the, the story is the same for next gen. They, you know, modeled their project as a standalone basis. Well, having the, the project sitting just a few kilometers apart, very similar geology, uh, you know, similar aspects in, in all ways and, and geographically sitting side by side. There's definitely opportunities, I, I think, to have, you know, a, a central mill in the area. And that would benefit uh, next gen, that would benefit Vision. It would also benefit other um, other projects nearby as well. So I see that as, you know, the, one of the options being a central mill that that's really... Uh, a Western Athabasca-based uh, proposition, um, where that you know, rather than having to duplicate exactly duplicate, you know, the cost of building your own mill, as you as you rightly noted, you know, we're over three hundred million dollars in uh, a part of the capex expenditure in the mill. Well, that's the same story for everybody else. If you could have a larger central mill, you really have the potential to substantially reduce um, uh, capex and really be able to. Uh, have far superior economics than even what we've already outlined. So um, I, I think it's uh, it's certainly an avenue we're going to investigate. That would require, of course, cooperation. Um, and, uh, you know, so we'll keep the lines of communication open. We're certainly, you know, well aware of what the, you know, the, the benefits for, for shared infrastructure are, um, you know, i.e. the shared mill um, opportunity, but there's also a number of other areas that, that uh, have cost savings for for shared like roads, um, power. You know, I mean, the the, S, the the list is sort of endless on on what the sharing opportunities are. But we'll be very cognizant of that, and I think that uh, you know that does require continued discussions. Uh, you know, with 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 our neighbors um, that are also actively exploring and advancing projects in the area. But I, it it to me, these are early days on the western side of the Athabasca Basin and. You know, I think the future looks extremely bright and perhaps some central cooperation on, on, on these these elements. And if not, we've certainly shown the ability that this has extremely robust economics as a standalone operation. So we can go either way, but my preference, of course, is to reduce CapEx as much as we can. Interesting points. As you mentioned, you are moving ahead as if this is a standalone operation in you did submit applications for construction of a mill in April of 2023. How is that process progressing? What's the timeline associated with those permits? Sure. So the, the permitting avenue that you're talking about is, is uh, our application at the federal level. So that's with the CNSC. Um, the CNSC, you know, have a just over a two year review period. So by the time we submit uh, in, in April 2023, we really wouldn't expect to get a decision back from the, the federal government until um, mid-2025, we'll say. So they run on a slightly different timetable than the, the provincial um, EIA, the Environmental Impact Assessment Phase, which uh, is another parallel track that, uh, on the regulatory body, but that's at the provincial level. It, it's a little bit different, but to get to your point, what you're asking about with the um, the submittal that we put in in April 23, I think we're looking at mid 2025 for the uh, federal government to be um, to be able to provide their their approval to go forward on that on that part. And you and your team are working on a number of development programs, and one of which is the environmental impact statement. Mm -hmm. And you're going to submit that in the near future. How's that coming along? Yeah, well, we're well on track. Uh, our uh, estimate is to be able to um, submit, and again, that, that's part of the provincial uh, regulatory uh, part of the equation. So um, we'll be submitting our EIS uh, 
documents to the, the province of Saskatchewan in Q1. So basically the quarter we're in this calendar year. So um, right now we're estimating on being able to do that in February. So, you know, which I mean, we're already approaching the end of January now. So um, I think we're going to be in a position to submit that uh, in, in February with the province. And, you know, and it, we're already well along the path of uh, the EA, the environmental assessment phase of work, which we initiated back, you know, in 2021. So it's been a, a, an ongoing dialogue with uh, both the province and the federal government. But uh, so, you know, we're already, uh, you know, ha have this back and forth with, with these regulatory groups, but just on the formal side, but yeah, we'll be submitting the, uh, the EIS, the draft EIS documents, um, you know, in, in a very, within a month or so. You really must love the whole permitting process. You know, it's it's complicated and yet uh, fairly straightforward. You know, it, it, it takes time. And I think that that's the issue. And, um, uh, you know, I, I think to uh, help us along, I think it, it goes a, a you know, great distance knowing that we have a really, really strong team, in-house in team. Um, our permitting and regulatory uh, knowledge and experience within the group, I think, is uh, second to none. And you know, and I, I'm absolutely convinced of that. You know, we have some of the top ex uh, permitting uh, experts from Cameco. Um, you know, leading leading the process, Cameco and Arano. So people that have been uranium mine developers and permitters in the past are. Uh, are working, you know, for for Fission on behalf of Fission on a, on a full time basis. So I just think the the skill levels there. We know the the process, what it takes to to move these projects forward. And um, yeah, there's uh, you know a lot of moving parts to it. But yeah, we're we're quite confident in, in our understanding of the process and the timelines involved. And that's a very good point. You have made a number of hires in the last year from people that have worked at Cameco, worked at Murano, they have experience working with uranium and also in the basin. And this is another advantage. And a lot of people that are getting involved in, uran in the whole uranium sector now, just because it's ripping here at hundred bucks a pound, they have no experience in the basin or in u uranium. Uh, you're, it's, a, it's a huge point. And um, yeah, I mean, your, your team is everything. You know, if you ask a question, well, how does uh, Fission intend to build a mine? How does it intend to be a developer? How does it intend to build a mine and go forward? Well, that's all about the people. First of all, we're blessed with having this tremendous asset that shows the, you know, the economic viability to do it. But you need to have the people with the experience that have built mines before that have operated mines relevant to um, you know the, the the type of deposits that we're talking about in the jurisdiction, and that's exactly what we have. We spent a good part of, of 2023 putting together the entire development team. So that includes the permitting uh, expertise that we talked about earlier, but on the engineering front, uh, on the processing front, on the health and safety. Uh, group, you know, we have nine full-time employees now in the development team, and, and if you look at the resumes and the, just the quality of people that we have on on the uh, on the fishing team, I think you'll find in every one of those aspects it's second to none. It's an absolute dream team um, uh, portfolio of people that we have, and we know this is a group that can that can carry us forward in, into building the uh, the project outwards. Uh, we opened an office in Saskatoon uh, in the fall of 2023, so I guess October is when we had our grand opening, um, and uh, you know that's really the development office there. So we're we're an established group in the province of Saskatchewan. Um, we've got all of our in-house expertise under one roof, and uh, yeah, we really couldn't be more pleased than than you know some of the accomplishments we've you know, been able to achieve in 2023 with respect to building the group and moving the project forward. And Ross, a large part of the success of any mining operation is also community engagement. Maybe you can just touch on that and what you've accomplished in the past year. It, it absolutely is. You know, it, 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 it's, it's key. We, we're up uh, working in the northern, um, northern part of the, uh, you know, the, the Canadian province. Um, we have a number of indigenous uh, uh, groups that that live up in that area that have small communities that are nearby. Um, 
uh, or you know, or just uh, so, some impact by by potential um, you know uh, dif different groups in the area. So we've been developing um, the relationships with all of our indigenous uh, uh, neighbors, communities. I mean, it's been a, an important part of our uh, process since day one when we you know first started working on this project is is opening up these doors, these relationships. We've achieved um, capacity funding agreements with. All of the all of the groups we we have uh, uh, you know that are represented I guess potentially impacted in the in the area I guess is how you would, would look at it we we've, we've got capacity funding agreements that means they're partners uh, of ours as we move the project forward through the envir the environmental assessment phase here um, they know what we're doing they have their own consultants on board their own uh, in, uh, environment uh, expertise. Um, they have their own legal counsel, and this, these are discussions that we have. So I, I think what we've seen is there's a great deal of support for projects like this. They understand the economic benefits for having projects in the north, and I think with that coupled with your communication and desire to bring everybody into the, you know, the the discussions and and determine well how can we best. Um, you know, fit in as an operating company in the northern community where they live and have lived for generations and generations. Um, yeah, I, I, I think we couldn't pick a better area than, than where we're at, but we've, we've got, uh, as I say, uh, capacity funding agreements signed with all of the, um, the areas, uh, indigenous groups, the rights holders, um, and we're working on impact benefit agreements. So, uh, you know, with, 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 with the key key groups as well. So that's something that we hope to be able to um, advance to the stage of, of final agreements in, in 2024. So, you know, they're on the near term horizon. As I say, I think that the, the appetite to see projects like this being developed in the area is, is very real. The communities want to see it. They understand the job opportunities, the services in their uh, the potential spinoffs, but you have to do it in, in such a fashion that um, you know, we have complete buy-in transparency on what it is, you know, how the project operates, uh, how to, you know, how, right from now in the development phase until, you know, through the whole mining cycle and, and when it's all over and said and done. So, um, yeah, they're, they're long-term uh, relations, but I think we've, we've built really strong relations and, and they continue to get better. And, uh, yeah, we're, I think we're, again, in, on that front, we have the, a group that's, uh, it's had a great deal of experience working with with northern communities, um, and you know I think we're I, I couldn't be more pleased with the, with the progress we're making on that front as well. Ross, I want to discuss your drilling program now. You just released that you're going to commence a, a winter drilling program. Maybe you can just touch on the targets and also how many rigs you're going to have and how many meters you plan on drilling. Sure. Yeah, we're just kickstarting off our uh, exploration program right now. We, we um, put out news about a, a week ago that announced that the drills were on site. We're bringing the the crews in. Um, you know, we uh, should be uh, drilling as we speak right now. Um, really, the uh, you know it, it's a lot of fun for us because we haven't uh, really done any regional exploration on the property since about 2017. Um, you know, we've really been focusing on development and advancing the triple R deposit, getting it into the uh, queue for, for uh, well, development and, and ultimately to be a producing asset. But we feel now is really the time to, to be out exploring. Obviously, you've got a really uh, exciting uranium sector that, that, you know, supports, you know, exploration process. We think PLS is, is the best piece of real estate in the entire Athabasca Basin region. And, you know, by that, I mean, we, you know, some of the best property for finding another deposit, I think, uh, you know, still the potential there rests on the PLS uh, ground. And now we've got a fully staffed, um, uh, well-experienced uh, exploration team. Some of the, you know, the, the same team really that, that led to the discoveries on uh, PLS back in the original discoveries back in 2012. and delineated all the way through and are, you know, and have uh, been with us for a long time. Anyways, two drills, we're testing multiple targets. We're going to focus at this point right along the Patterson Lake corridor where we have the triple R deposit. We're testing targets that are both along strike of the, the EM conductor, the electromagnetic conductor, the graphitic uh, 
fault zone and corridor. That's the reason the triple R is, is where it is. We think there's potential for finding more occurrences of high grade uranium along that trend. So we'll be testing that this winter. We're looking at parallel uh, uh, targets, so parallel conductor trends to the north of, of the triple R deposit, where you know we're, we're you know we're expect sort of the same kind of results of triple R. Um, we'll be testing there, and also to the southwest on the uh, on the saloon target. So two two drills right now, one set up on the saloon, which is southwest of triple R and one set up on the holster target, which is uh, just north of, of Triple R. So you know, it's, it's gonna be an exciting year. We're looking at uh, about 6,000 meters right now um, between uh, January 15th to towards the end of March. So we should be able to drill 6,000 meters, about 13 or 14 drill holes uh, using two, two drill rigs. So I think it'll be a full program and uh, yeah, we're very excited to to get back into the exploration game as well. And so your intent is to grow the triple R deposit to kind of find out where the outer boundaries are? Well, th this thing is to find new mineralization. It's not even so much growing the deposit itself because we're stepping out sufficiently away from it and, and on targets that are not really associated with the deposit, but more on parallel structures, parallel features. So if we find mineralization, it should be new and unique. Um, so not just incremental growth of the triple R, but actual new uh, new mineralized uh, tar or targets would, would, is basically what we're looking at, but yet nearby. So we're still within a few kilometers of, of the triple R deposit. So I think any um, you know any uh, discovery that we make, any meaningful discovery would. Uh, be able to benefit from, of course, the the triple R operation, right? You know, uh, the mining operation and, and mill in the area. So any uh, new occurrences of mineralization uh, it has a direct home, you know, so a direct impact on the project. So it it isn't just exploration in, in the frontier zones and hoping to find something new, but it it would all be very additive, I suppose, to the uh, to, to the operations that we're currently developing. So yeah, it's exciting, but these would be new targets and areas that we that we think have the potential for finding the next triple R. Ross, let's move on now and discuss your balance sheet and, and maybe you can tell us how much cash you have and how you're going to allocate that cash in the coming year. Sure, well, we've got a very healthy uh, balance sheet right now. Um, we're sitting at uh, $74 million in, in the treasury, no debt. Um, uh, that 74 million is basically able to fund us through the whole development uh, phase left. So the next two years, um, that, that'll that'll get us uh, to the point of construction on the on the project, basically. So we're we're funded to that point, point. Um, and that also includes the exploration program that that's ongoing right now uh, in the winter. Remember, last fall we raised about 9.2 million dollars in. Uh, in flow through funding, and that was earmarked for exploration of which the work I just uh, described um, here a few minutes ago. So we're basically with, with the funds that we have in place, that gets us through 2024. It gets us basically through 2025 to the point where um, you know construction begins on the project. So I think we're in a, a pretty comfortable place right now. Um, you know, we don't need additional funds at, at, at the moment, but, um, you know, so we'll be very, uh, very selective on, you know, if we do raise additional capital, how, how it is we go about doing it. But there's certainly no pressure uh, for us to, to be raising additional capital at this time. Ross, as we wrap up, we've covered a lot of different topics and maybe you can just summarize what investors should expect in terms of news flow in the first half of the year from Fission Uranium. Well, we're we're really busy right now, Jimmy. I mean, uh, we're 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 going um, full out on uh, on both exploration and development. Um, so look for you know continuous news flow, particularly on the exploration front. You know, where we're uh, be putting out news. I, I would imagine we'll batch drill results in uh, you know series of four or five holes at a time. That's typically what we do. And I think the benefit too with um, you know, in the uranium business, uh, particularly the Athabasca, uh, we, we get a sense of the um, of mineralization or the potential mineralization just by radioactivity. And so, 
you know, I think if we, um, you can see that almost, you know, with, with core coming right out of the drill site, you know, we can see whether uh, something is is, uh, is mineralized to, you know, high grade type potential. So we would be, look for a constant news flow, I think on the exploration front, um, we'll certainly uh, just uh, let the market know once we um, submit for our EIS you know, on the regulatory front for project development and any of the other major milestones that we you know, continue to hit along 2024, I think will be a really busy year for us. So you know, with, with uh, the team fully engaged, uh, we're well capitalized. We know what it is we're trying to accomplish in 2024. There's going to be a lot of moving parts and moving pieces, and of course, with a with a brilliant uranium sector that we find ourselves in. You know, I, we really couldn't uh, find ourselves in a, in a better place. And I think that, you know, uh, I guess the the final thought is, um, I think uh, your uh, people should have a look at the uranium sector, but really keep your eye on the development projects, the ones that can. Uh, realistically bring a product to market in a relatively short time period in the best uh, operating jurisdiction in the world, um, certainly with respect to the uranium business. That's Saskatchewan, that's the Athabasca Basin, and then, uh, you know, look for a team that can that can deliver, and that's uh, Fission Uranium. So, appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk about uh, the story today. Well, that was a great update, and I want to thank you very much for spending time with us today, and good luck on your upcoming drilling campaign. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Justin, thank you very much for joining us today. It seems like every time we get together, there's so much happening within the uranium sector, and this is why I like it so much. And the biggest news of late was the press release from Kazataprom stating that they would miss production targets for 2024 and 2025 due to a slowdown in construction and also the inability to secure sulfuric acid. I didn't realize this acid was so important, but anyhow. And, and I have to commend you on your comments. The last time we spoke in October of 2023, you were actually discussing this and you said it would be next to impossible for Kazataprom to meet their 2024 and 25 production numbers due to these very reasons. So you were way ahead of the curve. And I'm actually going to put a link in the show notes below so viewers can check that conversation out. But I want to get your thoughts on what you think of this current press release and what this means to future production. Sure. Thanks, Jimmy. I appreciate you having me on again. Um, yeah, it's it's quite the development and probably probably the most important development in the uranium sector to discuss and to and to consider if you are invested or considering investing in the sector. And that's because because Adam Prom is the largest producer of uranium in the world and Kazakhstan on 100 percent basis is unparalleled. They produce almost 60 million pounds a year, which is about 40 percent of the total global uranium production on an annual basis, at least for, let's say, 2023's numbers. So if the largest producer is missing production or 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 even buying uranium, that's a massive, massive development. And it's very important to understand and to and to take that information in uh, for Q3 of last year. It was pretty obvious to us that they would be missing their targets. And the reasons for that essentially were that when they came out and reported on Q3, they actually revised down their total 2023 CapEx. And something that's important to understand with ISR production, in particular when we're talking about Kazakhstan because it's so well established and the, the data is so well established for timeframes of investment of well-filled development and production, where you have the actual wells that are being drilled for this ISR production in Kazakhstan, you have a delay. So the first wells that are, that are drilled whether this is expanding into an existing deposit or drilling out a new deposit, it doesn't really matter. There's differences in terms of sulfuric acid usage, et cetera. But either way, a well field is drilled out. It's uh, that that ore body is impregnated with the sulfuric acid that has to interact with the uranium itself. That takes time. And then it's extracted through the extraction wells. And that process from this first well is drilled to the first production is about eight months. Um, it's a little bit longer, depending on the timeframes, of course. So they they have very, very harsh winters. They do very little drilling in January, February, and December in that order. And But eight to 10 months for first production following the well field development, then they get to full production about 18 months after that first well field development. So you have this pretty steep incline in production rates from the uh, particular well field 
after it's drilled out and injected with the with the acid. From there, it declines really quickly. So they have to constantly, constantly drill, constant drilling. It's it's not like you build an underground mine and you and you um, incrementally you know bore out bore out the ore and extract it to the surface. This is a, a nonstop process for the ISR development, ISR production. So if they're saying that their production is going to be 25 and a half thousand tons for 2024 and their production for 2023 was 22,000 tons, that's 3,000 tons. That's almost 8 million pounds of uranium increased production. You're going to have to see a relatively large jump in CapEx in order for that to happen. You're going to have to actually see it on paper that they're doing this work and they're doing more drilling than what they had done the previous six quarters, let's say, to get the production that they would have at that current time. So 2023's production essentially is a result of the CapEx spend from late 2021, early 2022. It's pretty basic. So when they say they're revising the CapEx down in their Q3 reporting for the total year 2023, it's very easy to say they're not going to hit these targets. And not only are they not going to hit these targets, I think for this year, for 2024, it's likely they're barely going to even produce any more uranium than they did in 2023. So, um, you know, I didn't highlight shortages of sulfuric acid or problems or, or delays, let's say, in the actual construction and development of these new projects. But it was just a, a simple look at the CapEx. If they're not spending the money, it's not coming out of the ground. And that's just, you know, very easy A to B analysis. And so that was an easy call to make. I wasn't the only one that made it, but I was pretty vocal about it because I think it's a huge development. As soon as that news came out, of course, it set the sector alight. And we've seen you know big returns this month, year to date already in the, in the uranium sector. So I was happy to see that. It's not a great, it's not great news for the sector, for the utilities, because the entire uranium sector and nuclear, nuclear industry is relying on increased production from Kazakhstan as the primary increase in production that they can rely on going forward because compared to developing new greenfield underground mines like dasa or aero or even the isr mine phoenix from denison these are going to take years and years and years and have a lot of risk a lot of development risk whereas an established producer that massively ramped from the mid 2000s into the mid 2010s you would think that it would be relatively easy for them to increase production. Well, guess what? It's not. So that reality is is slowly setting into the nuclear industry. The investing community, as always, sees things earlier. And the investing community has been right about almost everything from the bottom of the commodity in 2016. Been right about the fact that as prices rose, inventories would dry up, not become more liquid. Absolutely happen. Would be right about the fact that this structural supply deficit would equal rising prices. I mean, it's pretty basic from a commodities investing standpoint, but for some reason, the nuclear fuel buyers left the miners to to hang, just to hang out dry for a decade. Now the results of that are are coming to fruition. It's an extremely, extremely supply constrained environment. I think we're entering into a fundamentally different investment. At, from this point for the next few years, it's a fundamentally different situation, a fundamentally different uranium market. And it's going to take a little bit of time for the nuclear fuel buyers to, to accept this new reality and do what they have to do to secure supply. And that's where I think we are right now. Interesting comments. And I just want to put all this into perspective because that a problem, their previous guidance for 2025 was they were going to produce between 30 to 31,000 tons of uranium. And what's the estimate for 2023? Well, 2023, they were shooting for, I think, 22 and a half to 23,000 tons. I think they're going to come in right around 22,000 tons. 2024, for this year, they were estimating 25 and a half thousand tons or roughly 10% below their subsoil use agreements. Mm -hmm. So it's about a seven to eight million pound uh, annual increase on a 100% basis. So 100% is Kazanoprom and all of their joint ventures. The bulk of those are with Russia and then China, but they have a JVs with they have a JV with Cameco, they have a JV with the French, a couple with the Japanese, and then China and Russia has the most JVs with with Kazatomprom. So, those are their targets. Twenty twenty five for 30, 30 and a half to thirty one and a half thousand tons, or eighty million pounds, or a thirty five percent increase in production over their uh, existing production levels. 
is pretty much laughable. It isn't going to happen. And this release that they put out uh, a little less than two weeks ago basically called 2025 into question without really coming out and saying, we're not going to be able to do this there. They're saying 2024, it's unlikely we're going to hit our targets and possibly for 2025 as well. Well, the main thing to understand with the 2025 targets are the bulk, about two thirds of that increased production, that almost 20 million pound increased production that they're expecting for 2025, a, a big chunk of that is coming from the Budenovskoy six and seven mines. This is a joint venture with Rosatom. This was established in December of 2022. We believe this is one main reason why a lot of the C-suite left the company following this deal. They did not want this to go through, but of course it went through. This is a very, very large deposit. And it's going to take a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of sulfuric acid to get into development. I believe that there are delays there. But the interesting thing is with this deposit, even though it's a 49% ownership JV with, with Rosatom, this deposit, all of the uranium on a 100% basis, so Russia's side of that production and Kazatom Promise's side of that production, is already committed to Russia for the first five years of production from this mine. So this big increase that they're saying they're going to be able to accomplish, which eventually I believe they will. They're building their own sulfuric acid plant. It's going to be operational supposedly in 2026. Then you have that increased acid going into their deposits and an additional delay. So we're probably looking at a big increase in production, maybe 2027. All of that uranium for the first five years going to Russia from uh, both Kazanoprom and Russia's JV part of that, of that deposit. So this does nothing for Western utilities, which are largely under contracted, especially compared to the uh, the elephant of the room, which is China. And China has been the most aggressive buyer in the world for the past 24 months. Why this didn't absolutely wake up all Western utilities out of the slumber they've been in, I don't know. It's, it's quite confusing to me. But here we are. Very good points. And I, I want to ask you... I want to do a deeper dive on both Russia and China. But before we do that, I just want to clarify something on uh, sulfuric acid. This is something I know nothing about. But have you done much work on this? Is it truly a hard commodity to secure? It's it's not necessarily that hard to secure. Um, but a lot of their sulfuric acid comes from Russia. And as we know, over the past couple of years, we've seen some interruptions in supply chains. We've seen difficulties in shipping to and from Russia on a global basis. Um, there's been some exception to that because they share a large border with Russia and are, I believe, still have a lot of influence, state influence from Russia for Kazakhstan. So there's been um, there's been there's been some interruptions to that, those deliveries, but that's not the big reason necessarily why they're missing the production is shortages of the acid. Um, in my personal opinion, based on the work that we've done and by the work of uh, some of our contacts in the industry have done, is that. They're facing decline rates on most of their established projects. And this is something that happens in mining, right? In every single commodity, every single sector, a new deposit is developed. It is always high graded. So what that means is basically you go after the, the highest grade portion of that deposit first. And that's, that's always how it's done. And so this is no exception in Kazakhstan. And over time, these mines deplete. That's just what happens. It's a limited resource, right? So a lot of these mines are depleting. Now, what I believe has happened is that Kazatomprom has um, overfilled their contract book. And they signed, basically, to put it simply, they signed too many contracts over the past few years. And it hasn't left them a lot of wiggle room. So as this Budenovskoy 6 and 7 and then the French joint venture, the Urano joint venture, um, South Torkaduk, as, as these two deposits are being slowly developed and those are having delays, the existing deposits are facing decline rates that take more acid to maintain a certain level of production. So as the deposit declines in uh, in grades, essentially, and as uranium is, is pulled out of the ground, it takes more and more acid to produce the same amount of uranium from these existing deposits. And, and you can actually see that in their numbers. So you can actually look at their expected production and their expected sulfuric acid usage and do the math on that. And you can say, oh, well, it's going to take... Um, about 20% more, more sulfuric acid per pound of uranium produced going forward. Part of that is the decline rates of its existing deposits. Part of that is the actual um, impregnation of these new deposits, the Russian joint venture, the French joint venture. So it's going to take an enormous amount of acid and they just don't have enough. So in between now and when this new sulfuric acid plant is built, 
and these two new deposits are developed, they're going to have to use more and more acid just to maintain production on their existing deposits. That's what we're seeing right now. That's why we basically know it's impossible for them to increase production to the extent that they're saying that they will. Um, do we feel like they're essentially lying to the market? Not necessarily. Are they being overly and potentially irresponsibly optimistic? Yes. So we have, because Adam Prom also is facing a similar reality that all of the producers are facing, Cameco, Arano, Uranium One. Uh, they're all facing the same reality, which is these legacy contracts that they've signed in the late 2010s and teens into the early 2020s, when it was still, even though we had a rising price environment during that time, uranium went from $18 a pound 2016 and was incrementally rising, higher, higher highs, higher lows into the 30s over the, the following you know three or four years. It was still very much a buyer's market. We had an abundant above ground mobile inventory. A lot of carry trades were being done. And in order to sign contracts, especially for Cameco and some of these some of these producers that were not ultra cheap producers like Kazan and Prom in the Kazakh joint ventures, they were signing contracts and they were they were giving these um, kind of bonuses within these contracts, which are flex uh, flex provisions. So they would allow the utility signing a contract with them at the time of delivery to decide to de to receive more or less uranium sometimes up to 20% more or less than the contracted amount. So if you imagine you're in a bear market, you sign a contract in 2013, $40 a pound, it drops down to $25 a pound at the time of delivery, and your contract is, let's just say 50-50, market reference fixed price. What you're going to do is you're going to flex down, you're going to take less uranium from that producer because you can go ahead and go into the spot market and top up your inventories at a much lower price than that fixed price of that contract. So bear market flex down. That happened during the bear market. That actually created more supply into the market because if you're Cameco, you signed a contract in 2012, you're delivering in 2015, your buyer is flexing down, you have more uranium, right? Your, your inventories get bolstered. Maybe you sell a little bit on the spot market. Cameco is not really a spot market seller, but you get the point. Then the, then the tide turns. Now we're in a bull market. Contracts that were signed in the late 20 teens with a fixed price of $35, for example. Then it gets delivered in 2023 and you've got a spot price of 50, you're going to flex up. You're gonna take as much as you can out of that contract in, that will allow with that flex provision because it's cheaper than what you can top up in the spot market. So every utility that has been delivered uranium in the past 24 months has flexed up on their contracts to the extent that the contracts allowed and every producer is being squeezed. Their inventories are declining. In this past year, we've seen producers come into the spot market. Kazadam Prom, uh, uh, THK, Trading House Kazadam Prom has been in the spot market. Cameco has been a buyer in the spot market. The Russians have been in the spot market. The Chinese have been in the spot market. Everybody is buying here. Even the producers, the biggest producers in the world are competitors with their clients. This hasn't happened before. I wanna make this really, really clear. We have had fluctuations in primary production in the Iranian market over the history of the Iranian market. Okay, it's been very volatile. We've had an oversupplied market for one period of time that was essentially the 80s from primary production. But from that point on, we've been mostly at a deficit for primary supply with enormous secondary supplies. The Russians were enormous sellers into the market in the mid 90s into the early 2000s. We had megatons to megawatts. 20 million pounds a year for 20 years, uh, enrichment underfeeding for another 20 years. That basically is not totally ended. The Russia is still doing, but staying in Russia. This is a market with very, very little secondary supply, a huge primary supply deficit, and the producers are competitors with their clients in the market. This is new territory. It's a fundamentally different market. I think it's going to get pretty wild in the next few years. I don't know what's going to happen. We're going to have competition between buyers for the same pounds. We're probably going to see some force majeure and some contracts not being delivered on. That's really how tight it is. What is uranium worth during that type of environment? We're about to find out. So I want to ask you about Russia and Rosatom and also their activity in the spot market. And one of the interesting things about this company is that they will look at every aspect of the fuel cycle for a client. They will build the nuclear reactor. They'll look after uranium enrichment conversion services, and then we'll also look after the waste. 
And they currently have 18 projects on the go, and they're going to need a lot of uranium for those projects. And as you alluded to, there's chatter that they are short uranium that they've been buying in the spot market. What do you what have you heard exactly? They have the largest nuclear export business in the world. Um, like you mentioned, they have 18 projects that are in some various stage of being built, um, whether that's planning or actual construction across the board. And they have to fulfill into those into those promises, those contracts that they've signed with the buyers, the developers, whatever country is is purchasing these exports. And Russia is short uranium. So they don't have a lot of in situ resources in Russia. Um, they don't have a lot of uranium in the ground. They have a few mines in Russia. Their best assets by far are their joint ventures with Kazakhstan, with Kazatomprom. And they have huge enrichment capacity. And to the extent that they can actually produce uranium from underfeeding, which, you know, if you're a nuclear utility, you can essentially buy enrichment for uranium. If you can buy EUP or enrichment, you don't have to buy uranium and conversion. You can just buy enrichment. And that's been very constrained in the Western market, especially over the past 18, 24 months since the invasion of Ukraine. But Russia is short uranium. So they are aggressive buyers. That's one of the reasons, one of the main reasons, in my opinion, why they um, potentially force this 49% uh, joint venture with uh, with Kazatomprom for the Budenovskoy 6 and 7. It's a major, major deposit. But it's just one element of a very complex set of variables that uh, a highly reliable, large producer of uranium enrichment, Russia, is now a buyer in the market. It's it's the same thing with the Chinese, right? The Chinese, so the Chinese, in addition, I didn't, you didn't ask me about China, but there's similar dynamics here. While Russia is not building a large amount of reactors in country. They are exporting. So the demand is similar, right? China has 25 uh, reactors under construction right now. 25 under construction right now. And almost 200 in the planning and, pro and proposed phase. They think and act differently in the market than any other entity. They think long-term. Um, they are mostly price insensitive. They have an enormous inventory of uranium. They have five, six hundred million pounds of uranium held as inventories. Now, these are this is a critical state-owned asset held by state-owned corporations that are building these nuclear power plants. It's highly unlikely they're going to be parting with this with this fuel. They're not in this to um, to take profits in trading this material. This is highly, highly strategic. Very, very important for for state security why this inventory is so important to them. Now, the Chinese entered two huge contracts with Kazatomprom in the last 18 months. Very, very large. They were so large that on balance for each Chinese entity entering these contracts, that that would equal more than 50% of the book value of Kazatomprom. And there were two of those about six months apart. I don't know why this didn't absolutely shake up the Western market. Um, but they're huge buyers. Like I said, they've been buyers in the market. They've been buyers in the spot market. They're marginal spot market sellers for the previous few years. This last 12 months, they turned to buyers. Um, we've seen just recently that the Chinese visited Uzbekistan and made another uranium deal. Uzbekistan is sort of like Kazakhstan light. They're aiming to increase their production. They're producing about 10 million pounds a year right now. They're shooting for 15 to 20 million pounds by the end of the decade per year. Um, the French have been, made deals with Uzbekistan. The Chinese are now in there. Um, it's it's sort of kind of a land grab between China and Russia to the low hanging fruit of uranium, and they're beating the West to the punch. Very very important to understand that the West is um, not necessarily asleep at the wheel, but they're they're late. They're late for securing uranium going out into the next decade. And the Chinese are beating as well as Russia. Russia is making sure that they're covered for these exports. Yes, and you mentioned Uzbekistan. I believe it's the fifth largest uh, producer of uranium in the world now, according to the WNA, and it's only going to get bigger. So that's great detail on Kazataprom. Now I want to ask you about Cameco. We haven't heard a whole lot about Cameco here in the last few months since they came out with a press release. I believe it was in, a, in September saying that they were having production problems at Cigar Lake, and they're due to report here on February the 8th. What are your thoughts on Cameco, and what are you hearing? Well, this is going to be interesting because the Cameco conference calls are probably the most attended events in the uranium sector for uranium investors. And it's it has more to do with their market commentary than it does their actual earnings, right? So nobody's really paying attention to their earnings for the most part. I mean, to some extent, certain analysts are, but the uranium sector wants, they want to read the tea leaves from what uh, Tim Gitzel and Grant Isaac have to say, right? So 
Um, we believe they're going to report that they missed their targets for 2023. Um, to the extent that they discuss going forward for 2024 and call into question production targets for this year, we don't know. Usually, Cameco puts on a brave face. They don't really like to tell the market about problems that they're having. But what we're hearing is that they're facing some difficulties with their mining projects as well. And their existing mining projects, right? That's primarily in Saskatchewan, Cigar Lake, and MacArthur River. Um, Cigar Lake, we know based just on on uh, you know the analysis of the mine, the deposit that has been done over the years, that that it faces decline rates as well. So phase one of Cigar is set to basically be done with producing at the end of the decade. You know, 2028, 20, 2029. Um, the company says they're they're going to move on to phase two. Our understanding is that phase two of Cigar Lake is lower grades, higher cost production. Will they be able to get it done? Probably. But it's another, it's another example of a primary reliable producer with established mines not meeting their production goals. So what this really does for me is call into question all of the greenfield development projects because they're just not going to come online on time, on budget. They never have, they never will. And if the primary producers are running into problems, the uh, the secondary, the greenfield production uh, developers are going to run into similar problems. These are supply chains. These are shortages of skilled labor. The biggest producers in the world are having this problem. Why can't they attract the 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 skilled labor basically at any price? Because it's not there. Um, it's it's going to be a problem for the industry. It really is. And uh, you know, unfortunately for them, but fortunately for us, that means higher prices are are, are much much more likely. If the primary producers can't get it done, what does that mean for the developers? So you're not sound too positive about Cameco. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, look, they're they're one of the the main producers in the world. They're very very important for utilities going forward. Um, they've got they've got a lot of assets. They've got a lot of resources in the ground. Um, we've heard whispers that maybe Rabbit Lake might actually be brought back online. That is really interesting. They they shuttered that mine in the in the 2017, if I recall correctly. And for that to come back on, they have to be very optimistic about a pricing environment for Rabbit Lake to come back. They've got some pretty good assets, probably the some of the better assets in the United States. Uh, ISR uh, deposits in Wyoming, Nebraska. Um, you know, they're they'll they'll be just fine. They've also diversified. They're kind of uh, vertically integrated with the acquisition of the 49% ownership of Westinghouse, and now they have. Um, fuel fabrication, they've got more conversion. They have an investment in global laser enrichment. So the potentially at some point they'll have the enrichment. They'll have every every element of the fuel cycle at some point here. So um, they're vertically integrating. I think they've done a smart job with that acquisition, of course. It's not just a uranium mining company anymore. But as far as them being able to easily increase production, bring MacArthur back to 18 million pounds a year, get 18 million pounds out of cigar, that's proving to be a challenge for them. And if it's a challenge for them, you know, um, how, how can these other projects that are aiming to to come online on time on budget, how can they get it done if Cameco can't get it done? That's the big message to the market. Very interesting points. So I want to talk about equity valuations now, Justin. We, of course, the spot market, and you alluded to this earlier, but you said the spot market, like it's over 100 bucks a pound now. Numerous players in the market. Um, you, you said Russia was in there buying, China's in there buying, Cameco, Kazataprom, all buying in the spot. Then you have all these financial players that are also participating in the spot market. And I guess my question to you is, we're not really seeing the stocks or the equities uh, benefit from this rise in the, the spot market. So do you think the spot price has gotten ahead of itself and maybe it's being driven by all these exogenous factors that really don't represent the true fundamentals of uranium? Um, I would say no. I mean, the spot price is basically just the going rate for marginal pounds that are being bought and sold in a short-term uh, short term fulfillment market. So it is the real market, really. Uh, the term market, of course, I mean, the two markets are connected. And even though the term price that's published, you can just throw it out the window, it's utterly irrelevant. Um, three year forward, five year, five year forward prices are month over month being printed at substantially higher, uh, higher valuations than the spot price itself. So, um, this, the market is showing exactly what buyers and sellers are willing to, to settle on. And so that really is the real market. It's interesting because uranium is very different from a lot of commodities. There's no paper market. There's no futures market. Really. It's not a market that's manipulated. It is a physical market, pure and true. So whatever the price is, that is what someone is paying for it. 
And that's where we're at, $106 a pound right now. The equities, in my opinion, are, are drastically um, undervalued relative to the commodity. And you can see that very easily by charting URNM compared to the spot price. Now, of course, that chart is looking at the price of URNM, not necessarily the, the nav of that vehicle, right? So there's a lot more shares outstanding now than, let's say, the previous peak, November 2021. So as a total nav or market capitalization for the individual mining companies, a lot of them are at all-time highs right now. Um, but of course, the share price with dilution, that uh, doesn't necessarily represent the same gains. With all of that said, I think we're entering this, this new phase. And I actually was just shared with this morning a report um, from PI Financial. And they they had put together, I'm not going to share their content, but um, they had put together an analysis, basically taking a few companies in the sector and saying, okay, this is our analysis of, of their valuation of their, of their PNAV at 75 bucks a pound. This is what we think it is at 105 a pound. This is going to continue to happen, Jimmy, where we have all of these companies that have, these pre-production development companies that have done feasibility studies in the last three, four, five years. And they did these feasibility studies at 45, 55, $65 uranium. They're going to have to update these feasibility studies with 115, 120, maybe $150 uranium. The numbers are going to be absolutely shocking. And we're going to see, in my opinion, a major, major uh, reevaluation of the sector and repricing of these stocks. Once we say, okay, well, these things are getting way overheated. Um, when we were back at 75, 80 bucks a pound, these things are pricing in hundred dollars already. Okay. Well, here we're at 106. We could be at 150 by the end of the year. That's entirely possible. What are these worth at $150 a pound? And in my opinion, Jimmy, and this is really important. This isn't a speculative driven spike. So this is not being driven by the financial players. That's hugely important. This is being driven by the industry, by utilities, by traders, by producers, all in their buying. Yes, hedge funds are buying a little bit. Yes, spot is buying a little bit, but it's not being fundamentally driven by financial speculators. This is being driven by an actual supply deficit, a market lacking in secondary supply, and every player in the market fighting over pounds. That is what's driving this price. And we're not going to see the price level out, let alone come down until we see liquidity enter the market. Where's that going to come from? Everybody is going to hope and pray that China is just going to take one for the team and dump their strategic pounds into the market. We don't think that's going to happen. And so far, we have not seen any evidence of that happening. We've seen the price double, almost double in the past four months. Okay. That's a huge increase. What has happened? It is dry. No liquidity has entered the market. Everyone is holding on to their pounds. Nobody wants to sell here because the price trajectory is so clear. I think we're about to enter the situation where we see the price go well beyond what even the, the, the most wildly bullish retail investment speculators think that it could go to. I think we could see that. I really do. I haven't ever used this language before, but this is an entirely new environment here. I don't know where it's going to go, but I do think that wherever it goes, it's going to settle at a price much, much higher than the previously understood incentive price for those marginal projects, which you could argue is maybe a hundred bucks a pound, somewhere around here for the you know the low grade Namibian deposits, for example, right? I think we're going to settle into a price that's much, much higher, and you can actually see sustained prices far higher than where we are now, where miners, developers are going to be able to get into production and sell at those prices. What is Encore, UEC? Uh, uh, what are some of these projects worth? What are these companies worth? They're selling uranium at 150 bucks a pound. The whole industry is going to have to reanalyze these stocks with prices that are existing in this new reality. That's where we're headed. So you're suggesting we're going to see a major reset with the equities. I believe so. As soon as we see these official reports come out from very respectable analyses and uh, companies in, in the sector, we see these reports come out saying, hey, okay, this is what it's worth at 100. This is what it's worth at 150. The stock price, you know, we had priced in. Uh, so let's say next gen is worth 11 or $12 at 75 bucks a pound Canadian, right? 75 bucks down US, but 11 or 12 Canadian. What is it worth at 100, 100 bucks? 18, 20? I mean, th these things are going to be um, far, far more valuable at these higher uranium prices. It just takes time for that reality to set in. It's going to set in sooner for the investors who are going to recognize this first before the industry actually does. When the industry recognize it and you see 
an uncovered large utility come into the market and say, okay, we're going to have to pay $165 for this. We have no choice. When the reality sets into the industry, that's when we're going to see the price of uranium absolutely explode. And from here and, and from even higher, the investors are going to see it first. When the investors start to believe that this is not a price spike that's driven by by uh, by financial speculators and is impossible to, to, to understand where it's going or why, when they understand it's being driven by sector fundamentals and they believe that it's going to remain high for a sustained period of time, then they can say, oh, these equities are highly mispriced to the downside and I'm going to get in ahead of time. And that way, you can actually see this again as a contrarian bet. If you believe that the investors have yet to fully commit to the understanding of this new reality. It's a contrarian bet to be buying here. And I think the uranium equities are, are highly undervalued to the reality that we're seeing now and that we are going to see in the next 24 to 36 months. You touched on investors and I want to ask you about that. You speak to a lot of institutional investors and also retail investors. What's your sense? Is there still a lot of people not involved in this trade? Do you think more investors are becoming aware of the trade? It's happening, but it's happening slowly. It's it's really interesting. Um, we we talk to uh, you know all of the big hedge funds that are in the space, right? We we have connections with all of them. Um, they still are, are very much seen as specialty specialty vehicles. This is a, they're focused funds. Um, it's very niche, and uh, it, the generalists are slowly slowly starting to come into the space. We've seen, uh, for example, an in a substantially increased ownership by institutions of of URA. It's the most liquid ETF. Um, liquidity is paramount and liquidity is improving. So that's been sort of a theoretical um, position for a very long time that liquidity and size would beget more liquidity and size. That if you're if you're managing a billion dollars and you want to take a 2% position in uranium, you need X amount of liquidity. That's, that's it. Uh, it's more so than price, more so than valuation. Liquidity is paramount. So as the sector gets more and more liquid, we're going to see larger players be able to speculate in the sector. And that's slowly happening. I think that's going to continue to improve. Well, Justin, that was a great update. And it's always very insightful talking with you. And I want to thank you for making time with us today. If someone would like to learn more about you and your firm and the services that it offers, where can they go? UraniumInsider.com. Um, we published a monthly letter. We're focused 100% on uranium. Um, we have a very strong team behind us, very uh, great industry contacts. We have we do monthly webinars with our members. Um, we've outperformed the benchmarks by a significant margin since inception. We're coming up on our five-year anniversary this coming summer. Excited for that. Uh, it's, an, it's a very, very exciting time for the sector. Um, we're far off the bottom, obviously, for the commodity and the equities. But like I've mentioned multiple times in this chat, Jimmy, we think we think we're on the cusp of moving into a whole new, a whole new paradigm for the nuclear industry and for and for the commodity itself, and ideally for the equities as well. So yeah, we can be reached here on I'm on and off uh, with with Twitter or X. Yeah, it's not spending as much time there anymore, but I can still be reached there as well. Am I going to get an invite to your anniversary party? Absolutely. Yeah, you'll be top of the list. All right. Thanks very much, Justin. It's my pleasure. Did you know that every time you hit the subscribe button, your name goes into a draw to win $1 million? I'm just kidding. But if you do subscribe, it really helps us build our channel. Thank you for subscribing and thanks for your support. Hi, Phil. Thank you very much for joining us today. The last time we met, you had announced the merger of ISO Energy and Consolidated Uranium, and now the merger is complete. And ISO is a much larger company with many assets and many jurisdictions. And why don't we just start with what your focus will be going forward for the new ISO Energy? Sure. Thanks, uh, James. Great to talk to you, and thanks for, for having us. Yeah, as you point out, we closed the transaction in December. And we do have this uh, diversified portfolio, and, and the focus is really on becoming a multi-asset producer in the top jurisdictions in the world. Of course, we're focused on Canada, the United States, and Australia, and uh, we're going to be very active this year on projects, particularly in Canada and the U.S. And I want to focus on the basin you own, 20 assets within the basin and the most advanced is the hurricane deposit which has a resource of 48 million pounds a grade of 34.5 percent 
How will you continue to advance that project? What are the next steps? Yeah, so so we've got a couple of different uh, work streams on that project. The main one is drilling, and 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 I think we'll probably talk in more detail about that. But the drills will start turning at Hurricane in March. We're going to start it at another project called Hawk in the next few days. And in the background, we're working on some studies, internal studies to under to look at different ways to mine the deposit and, and and how we can advance it on our own. And one thing I should have brought this up, but as I mentioned, the, the grade is 34%. And why don't you put that into perspective for us? Because that is extremely high. But how does it compare to other mines within the basin? Well, I mean, it compares very, very well. It is actually the highest grade project in the basin. And really, the, and it, that makes it the highest grade project in the world. And I think uh, it's it's a bit hard to put it in perspective, but the rock value of our deposit is probably the richest rock of any commodity in the world, quite frankly, ever, which puts us in a very unique spot. And and at that grades that we have, it's contained in a very small amount of tons. And and for people in the mining business, and, and if I told them that this much material was contained in sixty three thousand tons. It's quite mind blowing when you think about some of the other mines around the world. I mean, there are projects in the world that are mining more than that and processing more than that per day. That's the entire deposit. So it's uh, it's very, very unique and very, very rich. And the Larock East, which contains the hurricane deposit, has many advantages. Can you just touch on these advantages and how they're going to impact economics? Sure. <clears throat> so, I mean, we'll start with just the deposit itself. Not only is it the highest grade resource in the world, but it's also very shallow. It, it sits at around 325 meters below surface, which makes it, you know, very economic to get out at that, at those depths vis-a-vis -vis some of the, some of the piers in the basin. And in the basin, you can have deposits that go down to a thousand meters. The other thing is it's very well located infrastructure wise. So it's about 40 kilometers from the McLean Lake mill. Um, there are roads that go very near the property and it's very close to a, to a, a, a small, town called points north so very easy to access again this will all be favorable for uh, for ultimately developing the project and you touched on this earlier but iso recently announced an upcoming drilling program maybe you can provide us with more details what are the targets how many rigs how many meters do you have planned yeah look so so we're very excited to get back in here and and look we've since the discovery of the deposit it's been it's been very well drilled around the known resources and and what we're what we're looking at now is is can we expand the resources on strike and in the basin these kinds of deposits they form in pods and so we found a very rich pod so far at hurricane but what we're now looking for is pods that that sit on strike along the conductive corridor we have two targets target a and target b which we identified through a very novel geophysical technique that we deployed last year called ant and what ANT does is it, is it identifies alteration. We ran the survey over top of Hurricane, found alteration, as you would expect. And then when we ran the survey away from the deposit on strike, we found these two other areas, area A and area B, with a similar uh, signature of alteration. So we're going to drill those. There's going to Our plan for this winter is six holes for about 3,150 meters. And, the, and that, that uh, drilling will start in March. And why why not now? Why do you have to wait until March? Well, so right now the the roads are being put into the project. It's uh, you know so, some of it's been weather dependent. The weather the winter came in late into this part of the world, but at the same time now that it's here and it's here in force, we've got to bring a, an ice road into the project, which is happening right now. We're also going to drill our Hawk project first, where the ice is ready, and in fact we should be drilling that any day. We're going to start at Hawk with two rigs. And once we're once the uh, the ice road is in and, and everything's set to drill at Hurricane, we'll move one rig over there, finish the Hawk program, and bring the second rig up to Hurricane. So that's a good overview of what's happening in the basin. Now you have a number of U.S. properties, including ones that are near-term production. What's your strategy with these properties, and how will you prioritize them? Yeah, correct. So so we have three past producing mines in Utah. They were in production in 2007, 2008, 2009, and they were putting on care and maintenance. Our plan this year is we're going to open up 
uh, at least one of those mines, and we're going to start at Tony M, go back in underground. Again, these mines, were, because they were in production, they're fully developed. All the surface infrastructure is there. They're fully permitted. They can be brought on back online very, very quickly. And we're planning to dovetail the timing of that production with the reopening of the Energy Fuels White Mesa Mill, which is just down the road. And we have a toll mill in agreement with Energy Fuels to process the ore there. So we're going to put out news on that uh, on, on that work program in the next couple of weeks and, and really detail those plans, again, which really focuses on doing all the work required over the coming months to deliver ore to the White Mesa Mill by the end of the year, if not early 2025. And, um, oh, I'm sorry, can you repeat that again? What did you say? It's going to start producing when? Uh, by either late 2024 or early 2025. Oh, wow, that's fast. Okay. Bill, I have to ask you about Coal Hills. It's based in the state of Virginia. It's the largest undeveloped uranium depositor in the U.S. Maybe you can give us an update of what's happening on that project. Yeah, look. So we're we're this is a this is a fantastic project, as you point out. It's the largest undeveloped project in the United States right now. Virginia has a moratorium on uranium mining, so currently we're not advancing the project per se. What we're spending our time and energies on is is building relationships with the local community, with the state state government, and ultimately hoping that we can uh, work with them to a, to a pathway to overturn the moratorium. And really, with everything that's happening in geopolitically around uranium, particularly in the United States, where there is a, a, a view and, and, and strong support for weaning the country off of foreign supplies of nuclear fuel, including uranium, we think that this project could be could play a very meaningful role in domestic production in the United States. And so in the background, uh, we're working away. We've hired lobbyists and, and, and we're very excited about the project and prospects for moving it forward over time. And it's surprising to hear that the state of Virginia has a moratorium on uranium mining, given that they have a very strong nuclear energy program. They have four reactors working and they also have a long history of mining. Yeah, look, and that's where we think the opportunity is. And, and when we look back to this moratorium, it was put in place in the in the early 80s. And really, it was done at a time that there were, were not regulations for mining uranium in the state. And it was done so that they could put those regulations in place. They were never put in place at that time because the price of uranium, quite frankly, didn't warrant the development of the mine. Today is a very different story. And I should point out, the state is very much pro-nuclear, not just the reactors that are there, but plans to build new reactors, including getting very active in the small modular reactor place again. So we think it's incongruent that this state would not allow this project to move ahead. Um, and also federally, just, just how important this project could be to supplying fuel for the country. Uh, we think it's we think we're very well positioned and, and there's a tremendous amount of optionality for the company in this project. And you also have assets in Argentina and Australia. Do you want to touch on those? Sure. Um, and, and Australia is going to be a, a jurisdiction that we're going to continue to focus on. The three pillars of this company are Canada, the United States, and Australia. These are the top jurisdictions for uranium mining in the world. And increasingly, we're seeing investor interest gravitate to these jurisdictions away from some of the higher risk jurisdictions, but also utilities are very interested in these jurisdictions. So we're going to be uh, active in Australia on our current projects, but also looking at ways to grow our business. Argentina, and, and for similar reasons to Virginia, we like Argentina. It is a nuclear country. There are There is a, a history of uranium mining in the country. But ultimately, we think that uh, Argentina is, is going to be non-core to the business going forward. And, and as people have seen in our, in our company in the past, we have successfully spun out, divested non-core assets in unique structures. And, and I think uh, that's, that's a place for people to look at uh, it, it, for us going forward to, to potentially do something like that with those Argentine assets. Phil, I want to move on now and discuss your balance sheet. You've recently done a couple of, uh, of raises and maybe you can just tell us how much cash you have on hand, how you're going to allocate that cash uh, going forward. And maybe you can also speak to the level of interest that you've seen from these raises. Sure. No, absolutely. And uh, uh, so as you point out, we, we've we raised money recently. Uh, one was in connection with the, the merger and the second was just recently on a, with a flow through tr flow through transaction to fund the Canadian exploration program. Q3 
Cumulatively, now we have over $80 million between cash and securities. We do own shares in, in some of the other uranium companies that we formed. And, uh, and the, you know, I, I would say that the financing that we recently completed on the, the flow through financing was tremendously well received. We priced the, the, the financing at $6.25, which was significantly higher than where the market was trading at the time. And that's common for flow through. But we were very, uh, very pleased and, and, and certainly represented a very low amount of dilution for the company. But more importantly, the, the investors that came in, a lot of existing investors, but quite frankly, some new investors that we hadn't had in the, in the company before. The financing was, was, was oversubscribed by uh, a multiple. And, uh, and so it was a very good, good deal all around. And those funds will, I guess I said, go towards the, the Canadian exploration programs and beyond. And as you mentioned, the flow through is only for Canadian investors. But what about when you raise the hard dollars? Where's the interest coming from? Is it just North America? Or are you seeing interest coming in from Europe, Asia? Well, the, the flow through could only be spent on Canadian projects, but the demand, the, the investors were from all over the world. In fact, we had uh, we've had investors from South America, from Canada, the United States, Europe, and, and lots of Australian interest, and then pockets of interest more further afield in, in jurisdictions in Asia that we've never seen before or other parts of Europe that, that we don't normally get investment from. So I think it really just speaks to uranium as a theme, as, a, as an investment opportunity. It's, it's gaining global interest and uh, it's manifested in, in investors that have come onto our register in the last financing. That's an interesting comment. So do you think there's more interest coming from outside of North America? I think it's I think it's pretty well balanced, but yes, I mean there are there are investors all over the world that are that are coming into this company, requesting information, joining our newsletter, participating in our financing, and it's it's really great to see. And I and I think it's because every day we're seeing headlines around the the nuclear space and the uranium market, and the price of uranium, of course, is attracting people today. Um, and it's really getting that global audience. And, and again, I, I, it just speaks to, I think, ultimately the acceptance of nuclear power around the, the globe that we can get investors from all these jurisdictions. Um, if they're supporting the equities, ultimately, I believe they're supporting the industry. So I want to move on now and discuss your portfolio of assets. You and your team have been very successful in unlocking value for shareholders by spinning out assets into separate companies. And is this a strategy you're going to continue doing going forward? Yeah, look, and, and you know, as we talked about Argentina a moment ago, I think that's that's an obvious target for us to, to, to do something like that. Again, I think that what we've been very successful at is is finding ways to to realize value from these assets, not simply just spinning them out on their own, but finding finding vehicles or, or partners to work with on these assets where one plus one can equal more than two. Uh, we'll continue to look at, at, at ways to do that. I think we'll also see we're going to continue to be busy on the M&A front ourselves. Uh, we do have uh, ideas about how to build and grow this portfolio. And we're really seeing that that bigger companies are getting a lot more interest in the market as we've grown, particularly through this latest transaction. The, uh, the, the demand and the interest in the company has grown. The trading liquidity has grown. The access to capital has grown. So we'll continue to look to get bigger ourselves. And uh, but but still, you know, look at rationalizing the portfolio where it makes sense. And so you mentioned you would spin off Argentinian assets, possibly. But what about Canadian or American assets? So you, you own 20 different assets within the basin. Would you consider selling off or spinning off some of those? Look, the basin is our is our backyard. It's our it's our core set of projects. And and one of the things about the portfolio in the basin is, you know, it's it's been around and was put together by very talented geologists from from going dating back to 2016. And a lot of these projects haven't seen a huge amount of exploration work because once Hurricane was discovered, Hurricane really took all the oxygen in the company and and rightly so. So I think there's a real opportunity for us to go back into these other projects, particularly with this this new technical team that came on less than a year ago, and, and look at some of these projects with fresh eyes. There's tremendous amount of uh, discovery potential in the basin, and so I think we'll do we'll do a lot of that for ourselves. 
ultimately some projects may uh, maybe maybe sold or joint ventured or divested as, as we see fit. But I think it's really incumbent upon us to uh, to look at these projects ourselves. And uh, with the flow through money that we have, and again, with the team that we have and the plans, we're going to do that. And ultimately, where these projects get to, uh, it's probably too soon to say. But again, we're going to focus on them ourselves to start. Bill, as we wrap up, maybe you can summarize for us what investors can expect in terms of news flow from ISO Energy in the coming months. Sure. I mean, I think the main focus that uh, the main thing investors should look for is in ac active work programs in both Canada and the United States. Drills are turning. Results will be coming out uh, from Hawk and from Hurricane. And then in, in, a, in a couple of weeks, an announcement of our plans in the United States. Again, we're going to be very busy there advancing those mines. And, and so it should be, uh, should be a very active year. And then less frequently, but, but to, to be watched for is news on both the M&A front and whether that's, whether that's things that we do to bring more assets into our portfolio, or as we talked about, divest some of the non-core assets. I think we'll, be, we'll have uh, activity on both fronts for investors to watch for over the coming year. Well, it sounds like you and your team are going to be very busy in the coming months. And I want to thank you very much for spending time with us today. And I look forward to our next update. Yeah, thanks, James. Great talking to you. Thank you very much for joining us today. I'm very much looking forward to this discussion on enrichment services. According to the WNA, Urenco is the second largest enricher in the world with over 30% market share. So you can provide an intimate knowledge on what's happening with that in that segment of the fuel cycle. And so much has transpired since the last time we spoke in London. And I wanna discuss all of these recent events, but before we do that, why don't you just provide us with a brief overview of Urenco and the various services that it offers for those viewers who might not be familiar with the company? Sure. Well, uh, Urenco is the largest Western supplier of uranium enrichment services with annual revenues around 2 billion euros and customers in over 20 countries. Urenco operates four facilities in the Netherlands, Germany, the UK, and the US that each produce enriched uranium required by nuclear plant operators around the world. Urenco is headquartered in the UK and is privately held, although we have an A-minus credit rating from Standard & Poor's and do issue euro bonds. Capital programs are financed exclusively through borrowings and free cash flow. Urenco not only processes uranium, we make sure that the natural enriched and depleted uranium we manage and produce is the right quality and quantity and is in the right location around the globe. Urenco moves more uranium around the world than any other company. Urenco owns 50% of a joint venture company with Arano called Enrichment Technology Company that designs and produces gas centrifuges and associated equipment used in the enrichment process. We also have a stable isotopes business that uses our core centrifuge technology to enrich and deplete non-uranic materials for medical, industrial, and, in, uh, uh, and research applications. Finally, Urenco operates a nuclear stewardship business, which is involved in the environmentally responsible management and interim storage of uranic materials, recycling, and decommissioning services. That's a very detailed overview. Thank you. So, Kirk, I want to look at the enrichment process now, and maybe for before we do the deep dive on it, maybe you can just give us an overview uh, of what it is exactly. And when we look at the fuel cycle, it starts with mining and milling of the ore, then it moves to the conversion stage and then to the enrichment stage. Maybe you can just give us an overview of what exactly it is without becoming too granular. Sure. Well, in its natural state, uranium consists of several isotopes, but only one, uranium-235, is useful as fuel in the current light water reactors and the advanced reactors being designed currently. Unfortunately, the natural concentration of U-235 is less than 1%, whereas these reactors require much higher concentrations. Urenco introduces gaseous natural uranium into a series of rapidly spinning centrifuges, where centrifugal force separates heavier uranium isotopes from lighter uranium isotopes, creating two uranium streams. One stream, enriched in U-235, is sent to fuel fabricators, while the other stream, depleted in U-235, is retained for either future enrichment or disposal. That's great. Thank you for that. So let's dive right in and let's look at 
pricing. So much has happened since the invasion of Ukraine in March of 2022. And I can't believe we're going to be coming up to two years since that happened. But every aspect of the uranium fuel cycle, the prices have, have gone up significantly. So maybe you can provide us with an overview of what's going on with the enrichment price right now and how that's changed since March of 2022. Sure. Well, that was the month that Russia invaded Ukraine. And at that time, long-term enrichment prices were $65 a SWU or separate of work unit. Concerns about security of fuel supplies and ambitions for greater use of nuclear power since then uh, have driven current prices to about $150 per SWU. Spot prices are even higher, but only about 2% of enrichment demand is purchased on the spot market. That's an interesting point. So if 2% is purchased on the spot, where is the balance coming from? Now, 98% of enrichment services that are purchased by nuclear power operators are purchased under long-term commitments. So the long-term price, it really informs where our business is headed. And Kirk, in addition to an increase in pricing, what about the terms and have they gotten longer? Yeah, there are two uh, really non-price terms that are important to consider in total enrichment contracts. Uh, one is the feed lead time. This is the amount of time that we require natural uranium to be delivered ahead of our delivery of the enriched uranium product. And this is informed by transportation time, logistics, and processing time, as well as delivery of enriched uranium. Uh, transportation is uh, getting more challenging, uh, so the lead time that uh, that we require to ensure a timely delivery of enriched uranium is getting slightly longer uh, compared to uh, past years. The other parameter that's important to consider is tails of assay, or how much U-235 we leave behind in the depleted uranium stream. Uh, the higher the tails assay is, the more efficient our processing uh, is in our plant and the more enriched uranium we can produce. Given the pressures on the market, tails assays are tending to be higher in order to optimize production of enriched uranium today. And during our last discussion, you also made mention of the fact that fuel buyers were moving away from Russian sourced enrichment services. And some of the elements that you mentioned that were very important too the fuel buyers were security of supply, flight to safety, and also secure and sustainable partners. Are these elements still very important? Absolutely. Um, although there's been no interruption in Russian fuel deliveries anywhere in the world to date, Russia's invasion of Ukraine and subsequent Western non-nuclear sanctions have shaken much of the market's faith in the ability of Russian nuclear fuel deliveries over the long term. And we have commonly seen the requirement non-Russian in customers' requests for proposals over the last two years. And Kirk, when we look at the fuel buyers or the utilities in various regions of the world, Asia, Europe, or North America, is one more aggressive than the other one? Or is there one region of the world that's more aggressive in acquiring enrichment services than other areas? You know. You know, I'll say all nuclear power operators are concerned with security of fuel supply, as are the governments in which they operate. I think there are different perceptions of the risk of Russian fuel supply delivery, which drive procurement strategies, and some do have a regional dependence. For instance, VVER operators in Europe were 100% dependent on Rosetta deliveries. These are also in countries that were significantly impacted by cutoff of other Russian energy supplies. But they have a different perception of the reliability of Russian supplies than other countries. Another example is in the US where there are limits on Russian supplies via the Russian suspension agreement. There is a perception that these limits will be further reduced through federal legislation, which influences procurement. And I should add that Western fuel cycle companies are looking to governments to provide some certainty about future Russian fuel imports to ensure that any new investments do not become stranded investments. Very good point. In the U.S. is Uranco's largest market. What are U.S. utilities doing in this current environment? Well, it really depends on the specific utility. 
Uh, although I think all utilities welcome the price impact that Russian supply had in the market over the last decade, many had no exposure to Russian supplies at all. For those that had some exposure, they've been busy mitigating against potential disruptions in Russian fuel supply through building inventory, restructuring existing contracts, and signing new ones. With or without exposure to Russian supplies, however, there has been a tremendous uplift in the volume of long-term contracting, in, for example, uh, deliveries in 2027 and beyond. Are there any major contracts that Urenco has been awarded that you can discuss or speak to? Well, you're right. Most of our contract commitments are proprietary, but there have been a few notable exceptions. First, both UltraSafe Nuclear and Ontario Power Generation selected Urenco USA to provide uranium enrichment services required for, to fuel the first of the kind reactors that the two companies are deploying. UltraSafe is developing a gas cooled micro reactor, while OPG is building up to four GE Hitachi BWRX 300 small modular reactors. Second example is Urenco signed a significant new contract for the long-term supply of enrichment services with Ukraine's national nuclear operator, Energoatom, helping to strengthen that country's energy security and independence from Russia. Overall, from the end of 2021 to the end of 2023, our forward order book has increased by 75%. So there have been some significant new commitments made since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And the DOE has issued RFPs for enrichment services. Can you speak to these at all and provide some color? Sure. Um, there are two requests for proposals, one for the supply of high assay LEU, that is uh, uh, low enriched uranium that's enriched up to 20% concentration of U-235. And the other RFP is for the deconversion of that HALU from UF-6 to other chemical forms. My understanding is that the objective of the US government is to help create a diverse and domestic capability to produce high assay LEU as rapidly as possible in order to enable deployment of the advanced reactors that DOE is also helping to fund. The UK has also recently announced a roadmap for nuclear power deployment that includes an objective for HALU fuel production. Urenco is contemplating production of HALU at its existing facilities in the United States and the UK, and therefore has an interest in both government's programs. And Kirk, when you look at these expansions, let's just say the one in New Mexico, what's the timeline associated with that? Is this something that you can just start up or increase capacity within a few months, or does it take a year or two years? Well, you're right. In, in terms of adding capacity, there is a supply chain that needs to be loaded up and executed. And so it's not a matter of months, but the expansion that we announced for our US project will start to produce increased quantities of enriched uranium next year in 2025. And that expansion will be complete by 2027. We've subsequently announced expansions at both of our facilities in the Netherlands and Germany. And those expansions will start producing more enriched uranium in 2027. Kirk, maybe you can tell us how the market has changed since we last spoke at the WNA Symposium in London. Sure. Um, well, I guess uh, government pol policies have continued to embrace the use of nuclear power to enhance energy and climate security. So the foundation for fuel cycle investment has become more firm. For example, at COP28 in December, 20 countries pledged to triple nuclear power generation by 2050. In addition, both the UK and US governments have indicated they will move soon to ban the use of Russian uranium products in their respective countries. This will be a key consideration for Western investors across the fuel cycle. On the advanced fuel front, Urenco USA formally submitted a license amendment request to the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission to use its existing facility in New Mexico to produce enriched uranium with up to 10% U-235 concentration. This concentration of U-235 will support use of accident-tolerant fuels in the current fleet and some of the advanced reactors that are being developed. Kirk, as we wrap up, nuclear energy is undergoing a renaissance. The last time we spoke, you referred to as the overall mood as abundant optimism. Do you still agree with this statement? 
Yeah, I think uh, I would double down on that statement uh, of abundant optimism. The amount of money that investors are spending to develop new technologies and deploy new technologies is astounding. Uh, we haven't seen this level of investment since the 1960s when nuclear power promised to be too cheap to meter. I don't think it'll be too cheap to meter in the future, but it will be absolutely essential to meet our energy and climate security goals. Well, Kirk, I wanna thank you very much for spending time with us today and sharing your insights on the enrichment component of the fuel cycle. Once again, thank you. Thank you, James. It's been a pleasure. Did you know we're now on Spotify and Apple Podcasts? So now you can listen to us on Spotify or Apple and listen and learn when you're stuck in traffic on the 401 in Toronto, the I-95 in New York, or the I-5 in LA. So be sure to subscribe and follow us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Hi, Lee. Thank you very much for joining us today. It seems like every time we get together, there's another milestone being met at NextGen. And 2023 was a significant year for NextGen Energy with the Provincial Environmental Assessment. And we can't, can't underestimate the significance of this approval. Maybe you can just expand on that. Yeah. Hi, James. It, uh, it's a significant milestone in, in the resources sector, full stop. Uh, our provincial uh, approval was the first one in over 20 years. Uh, it was the fastest one that uh, had ever been approved as well. And look, I think that's a function of the, the very strong technical setting and benign environmental setting of the Rook One project, but also the, the project management that uh, was performed by the team in understanding the rules and regulations uh, incredibly well to a very fine level of detail. Uh, delivering all the requirements from a technical, environmental, social uh, aspect with respect to uh, that proactive stakeholder engagement with the local communities and the government departments, and basically taking a, a partnership approach which respected all stakeholders right from the outset and, and being honest and transparent with the issues and communicating what is the most optimal path forward for the development of this project. And uh, we, we've got excellent partners in, in the, the four communities in our local project area and to have them all signed up with impact benefit agreements which reflect their uh, understanding and support for the project. Uh, you know, it, it's just a wonderful model with respect to how companies and communities can partnership in the successful development of a project. So. That has all culminated in, in uh, receiving that provincial approval. It is surprising. Uh, it's the first one in over 20 years. Um, it does bring to light that the barriers to entry in the mining sector uh, are um, significant. And, uh, and uh, it's, it's one which we're incredibly proud of uh, as an organisation over a long period of time uh, to have uh, achieved. But... It's one milestone. We've got plenty more ahead of us. And as an organisation, we've always been looking forward to the moment that we get full approval, and, and that is federal approval as well, which we are very, very confident on is imminent, and then getting into construction. Because once we're in construction, all aspects are, are back in our hands. Um, and uh, we, as an organisation, we're very much looking forward to that opportunity. Uh, and I have to admit, as an investor, I don't fully appreciate the complexities associated with the permitting process. But nonetheless, I'm still very surprised it's the first one that's been issued in 20 years, especially in this environment where we're running at deficits every year and the market is starving for more uranium. Yeah, we we, we need more uranium development companies uh, coming online and in order to fill the gap. Rook One is re is merely going to replace uh, production that will be coming offline between now and uh, 2028. Um, the world needs more uranium mines and it needs it from a diversified uh, sovereign location. We want to see more mines in Canada. We want to see more mines in the US and Australia. 
And that's very, very important when you consider that the current global production, over 80% of it is under a severe sovereign risk or technical risk. And so we need more very conventional, uh, well understood, highly um, reliable mines in solid jurisdictions uh, politically to come online. And so if we in some way have helped um, open up the avenue for that, uh, being the first one permitted in over 20 years, um, well, that's something we're equally as proud of um, as an organisation. And the world will be facing a power energy crisis in the not too distant future. And the provision of nuclear energy is absolutely essential in meeting that energy demand. And energy is the key component of a, a sound uh, standard of living for the world's population. Lee, as you mentioned, the next significant step is the federal technical review of the Rook One project, EIS. Is this something we can expect in the first half of the year? Yes, the, the process from here is we're expecting in uh, February to have an update from the CNSC with respect to uh, all the questions and comments that we received as a consequence of their technical review and the 120-day public review that was completed in November 2022, so uh, about 14 months ago. Since that time, we've, we've looked at all the questions. A lot of them were confirmatory in nature as to aspects in that are, that are deep in the, the uh, federal EIS uh, document. Since that time, we've had the provincial approval of the EIS and the, and the, and the two documents are identical, uh, but for some uh, nuances. And we have worked with each uh, of our four uh, communities in going through all of those aspects, uh, ensuring that they're understood and supported and then signed off. And so uh, as a company and, and as part of the process, we have gone to all stakeholders, uh, being very transparent with those questions, got support for all of those aspects. And we delivered that back to the CNSC in November of this year after the provincial approval. And we're expecting in February to receive the outcome of all of that work. Uh, from our perspective, there's no remaining issues. Uh, we've addressed every one of them. And we have full support of all the key stakeholders, the province um, and, and also the uh, communities that are in the area. The communities have sent formal submissions to the CNSC and the federal government demanding approval of the project. Um, and uh, obviously you can, you can um, uh, see that the the uh, stakeholder engagement with respect to the Rook One project from right from the very early days back in 2012 has been very thorough, and, and that's why we're in this position. We are waiting imminently for the CNSC to conclude its process in order to be granted a a commission hearing date and then subsequent approval in order to to commence construction. And you've also initiated a number of applications for approvals for earthworks and shaft sinking and other elements. When can we expect these permits? And are these coming from the provincial government? Yeah, so they're, they're combined. You, you need both provincial and, and federal uh, licensing uh, aspects. That the, the fact that we've lodged those applications signifies our confidence in, in that the, the federal EA process is, is close to conclusion. And so we uh, are ready and, uh, and able and, and looking forward to the time that uh, we complete the federal uh, permitting process and licensing process in, in order to uh, commence construction. And Lee, when in production, Rook One will produce 28.8 million pounds annually in the first five years of production. And I want to put this into perspective for our viewers and just how significant that number is. Yeah, it's a highly significant number when you consider that the world's uh, expected, uh, it, the, the final numbers are coming in from 2023, but it's forecast or, or, or anticipated to be between 135 and, and 140 million pounds. Just under 30 million pounds of, of 140 is, is very significant as a percentage around 
23, 25% of the world's production. It's incredible when you consider that Russia and, and Russian influenced countries currently produce around 45% of the world's uranium supply. Um, the US imported around 45% of their nuclear fuel from Russia and Russian um, influenced countries last year. When you look at Rook One being located in Saskatchewan, Canada, tier one jurisdiction, with a very uh, uh, um, strong production profile, reliable production profile of 30 million pounds per annum, it really does signify the global importance of the Rook One project getting into production in order to diversify sovereign risk and, and, and also the technical risk and provide a reliable source of, of 30 million pounds annually. Those 30 million pounds, that been a very large percentage of world production. Interesting when you consider that uh, Saudi Arabia uh, accounts for about 12% of world production of oil. The world's up and coming most most important energy fuel, uranium, will be will be dominating the world's market at about 25%. Um, possibly higher by the time we're in production because of those other mines are rolling off. And, and so we take that incredibly seriously. We understand the global importance of our project. And uh, and that's also been reflected by the interest from utilities that we have in uh, Rook One production. Um, we're getting uh, an enormous amount of interest. Some of the, the offtake uh, discussions are, are more advanced than others, um, but it, it really has ramped up in the last six uh, to 12 months with as as we're progressing the project, but also as this market starting to signify that the current production of uranium is very fragile. And so I want to ask you about the offtakes, but before we do that, I want to ask you about construction. And I know there's still a lot of unknowns associated with, with associated with permits coming from both the provincial and federal governments. But under a best case scenario, when can we expect commencement of construction? Well, we're very confident of we have the provincial approval, and so we are very confident of the federal approval. Uh, we'll have a better gauge of that uh, end of February, um, in a month's time from now. But we see no reason we could not be permitted in 2024 and immediately commencing construction. We uh, have done 100% engineering of the early construction items. We, we know exactly what we're building. It's a very simple mine. Uh, it's 1,300 tonnes to, uh, per day. So we're basically moving an ore volume of about one and a half double-decker buses um, a day. It's actually, whilst 25% of world production, uh, it'll be coming from one of the world's tiniest underground mines. So uh, we, we anticipate um, federal uh, EA approval this year. Uh, we see no reason why that cannot happen, um, given the stage we're at and the support we have for it from all stakeholders. And uh, we're ready to build it. We, we, as I said, all the early stage items of construction are 100% engineer, and we have the team in place uh, ready and able. So let's talk about the economics now. When the most recent study was done using $75 uranium, the net present value came in at $5.8 billion. And if we were to use $100 uranium, right around where the market is now, what would the economics look like? Yeah, it gets to, uh, it, it, would, it would take us into the top 10 mining companies worldwide, excluding gold companies. Um, so it's it's uh, incredibly impressive economically. I haven't seen a project with this type of internal rate of return, sovereign uh, uh, location profile, benign impact on the environment um, as I have this project and in all of my years in resources. It will, it will generate after tax net cash flow of around $2.1 billion every year. Um, it has an extremely low all-in cash cost, around $10 a pound. And so at $106 where we are today, yeah, we're, at, we're above $2 billion um, uh, after tax net cash flow every year. And so that takes us into the top 10, about number eight of all mining companies worldwide. At $150 a pound, which I, I think is um, 
going to be a reality in the near future. Um, you know, we're, we're knocking on the door of the top five. Um, so this is going to generate exceptional monetary returns for, for everyone involved. Um, but on top of that, the, the contracting that it's going to generate for local communities, Saskatchewan and Canada, the royalties to the provincial government and the federal government will make it one of the most significant resources project in Canada. And then on top of that, when you consider all the employment, but also the fact that it's 30 million pounds of uranium is the equivalent of powering 46 million homes in the US or removing 70 million vehicles of CO2 equivalent off the road a year. This project goes far from a benefits point of view, goes far beyond that of just the pure economic, which it's going to be the one, one of the world's leaders in, in any event. So phenomenal returns um, and, and the, a differentiating aspect is that we're a uranium company with full exposure to the future prices of uranium. I mentioned $150 a pound. I personally think it can go a lot higher than that uh, when I look at the cost structures of the current producers and that in order to incentivize development projects to get into um, production. So when you consider we have 100% exposure to future uranium prices, it gives us a very unique differentiator because a lot of the existing producers are fully hedged and uh, it's well documented. Uh, the Western world's leading producer in, in, um, in uh, Cameco are openly state they have their production hedged for the next five to seven years. They do have um, uncontracted pounds still to, to put in the contract book, which will be more market related prices, but um, we offer full leverage to future uranium prices, and we'll maintain that um, philosophy given that the technical nature of our project provides very high certainty around production volumes from one year to the next. And Lee, just because we're discussing the economics associated with the project, maybe we can also touch on your contracting strategy and what exactly it is. Yeah, we, uh, we will keep levered to uh, market prices at the time of delivery. We have, we're in competent uh, basement rock with a very simple metallurgy. We can ramp production up and we can ramp production down. In fact, what we're working on at the moment is looking for flex capability in the mine um, in order to possibly um, produce more than 30 million pounds you know, subject to a provincial and federal approvals once we're in production to, to see whether we can increase production because the market's demanding it. Um, again, very small mine, very benign impact environmentally. And so we're, we're currently looking at that as we finalise engineering. And every pound that we produce will be around uh, exposed to the market prices at the time of delivery. That's our philosophy. We have the technical setting uh, and the and the cost setting in order to do that. And that's new in this market. It's never existed before. And so at next gen, we we're going to ensure that all of our stakeholders are always exposed to the future prices of uranium. And we have downside protection because we have such a low cost base. This this project makes money going down to $25 a pound uranium. Um, now, I don't see us going as as a, as a uranium market. I, I think the the uh, downside is well understood. When you look at the average cost of production worldwide from Western world producers, it, it's hovering in the mid 50s to 60s. And so I don't see a scenario of, of the uranium price for many decades um, uh, heading back to those levels that we've seen over the last decade, I see it going a lot higher from where we are today. So 100% exposure to a rising uranium price. Always. Lee, I want to move on now and discuss your balance sheet and possible funding solutions for the $1.3 billion CapEx. You're sitting on over $450 million in cash. The ATM was recently updated to sell up to $500 million in additional stock. You also raised $110 million last year through a debenture offering. Maybe you can just speak to all of this and how these options can be used to fund Rook One. 
Yes, uh, James, look, we're experiencing a significant increase in investor interest in, in next gen. It's a function of our stage of development, federal permitting imminent, construction imminent. And uh, interestingly, a lot of that um, uh, increase in, in the interest in the story is coming from the Southern Hemisphere, from uh, the Australian Stock Exchange and, and also uh, Asia. ASX has always been very resource uh, focused uh, investment platform. And so at the end of or Q3, early Q4 last year, we uh, sold Patterson's, became a new shareholder, a very long, well established, um, uh, high profile investor down in, South, uh, down in uh, Sydney, uh, along with some other uh, funds uh, on the ASX, very large. Um, uh, pension funds, or, or they're called superannuation funds, down in uh, down in Australia, and we raised a, a, a total of three hundred million. Uh, we did a little bit through the ATM as well, and the nature of those financings, we did it at a, a one and a half percent discount to the spot share price at the time, so they were very non dilutive, and they've gone to really strong uh, hands that understand resources see the fundamentals of uranium improving and see that next gen has terrific leverage to rising uranium prices. We've also had the, the aspect that um, uh, as recently as um, uh, this month, uh, Li Ka-shing, uh, who was a long-term uh, shareholder of next gen dating back to 2016, absolutely instrumental in giving us uh, the ability to develop this project as optimally as we have. You know, their average entry price was in the low twos. We've replaced that in recent times with shareholders from the ASX um, with an average entry price of, of $9.50. So we've, we've seen really good um, turnover of our core um, shareholder base. And uh, Lee Kashing made a phenomenal amount of money, which we're all very, very proud of. And uh, and it still is a shareholder it's, uh, at around, I think last reported at around uh, 4%. Um, we have these new shareholders coming on board, which, which uh, are fully invested in the next gen story, not only Uranium Fundamentals, but uh, the importance of this project and the economic social and environmental returns of this project. As you said, we have 450 million in the treasury as we speak. Uh, that funds us incredibly well um, in the event that we we do receive federal permitting this year and we immediately get into construction. We're well financed for at least the next two, two and a half years, um, including the long lead time items that uh, we've we've already committed to. We will need to raise additional money. Uh, we announced last year in May that we had expressions of interest of over a billion dollars US in debt. That number and that that level has increased um, significantly since May of last year when the price of uranium was $50 a pound. We're now at 106. Um, and so we, we have a lot of funding avenues for the construction of the project. Costs have gone up. Our feasibility study number of 1.3 billion Canadian in February 2021 is subject to inflation, just like every other resources project. Um, but the the an increase in the capex of of the Rook One project isn't sensitive. The capex uh, going up does not affect the after tax NPV or internal rate of return of the project. So the project is very insensitive to any increases in, in CapEx, um, but we're not about to spend a dollar we don't have to. Uh, we will ensure that this project uh, is um, delivered on time and budget and in an optimal economic um, fashion. As mentioned earlier, we are looking at aspects to, to leverage flexibility around uh, production levels uh, and design that into the project possibly uh, from the outset. So we're really doing those trade-off studies as, as we speak, as we're concluding the final engineering. Um, we are um, expecting to finalise the funding package for the construction of the project at the same time we receive federal approval. 
And uh, I'll just say to, to viewers, the number of additional avenues that we are receiving to optimally fund this project is, um, look, I had high, high expectations, but they've been exceeded. And uh, they're coming from sources which are uh, energy focused. And it's really good news for all investors because it is further recognition that the, the role nuclear energy has to play on a world stage going forward is absolutely paramount. And uh, it, it's uh, really pleasing to see that that practical science-based approach to energy policy is starting to prevail. Lee, NextGen is unique for many reasons, including the sheer size and scale of the Work One project, but also because you're building a new platform, a new type of mining company. Maybe you could just expand on that and summarize what exactly we mean by that. Yeah, look, we we when we discovered this project, we knew immediately that we had a, a world class uh, project on our hands, and that's only uh, uh, but it's in the ground. And so I immediately took the tack as an organisation that we're going to judge ourselves not on the quality of the asset, but on our ability to optimise the outcomes from extracting that that ore from, from the ground. And not just from an economic sense, we wanted it from an economic, a social, an environmental and a total stakeholder um, perspective. And so everything we've done since that day of discovery has been about setting a new level, an elite level for the resources sector. And to date, we've done that in every aspect of our organization. Um, we're well recognized uh, for the efficiency of the, the discovery. There was no project over a hundred million pounds ever discovered in uranium in the Athabasca Basin for such a small cost per pound. More so from a, a meters drilled perspective, we employed new technologies that hadn't been used before and, and they worked. And that resulted in a faster definition of the project and also a, a more um, validated uh, data points with respect to the project in order for us to make good decisions. Our social engagement, before we even drilled the first exploration hole, I introduced myself to all the communities. Our social programs recognise that there's a job to be done in, in regional Canada. And, and uh, we're very, very pleased and fortunate is the view that we take that, that we're in a position in order to be a, a, um, a large component in generating positive change. And, and so the culture is unique and, and I think it is new in a lot of respects um, with respect to what you know, we, we believe the investors, all stakeholders can expect better from mining. And um, we take the responsibility of leading that change for a more positive future for all stakeholders. Um, it's actually, it, it's very core to our culture. It's not for everyone, but the group that you see at NextGen, it's very, very important to them. And uh, we'll continue to do what we're doing, how we're doing it, setting new standards. And, um, and we're very proud of that aspect of the organization. That's a great overview. Uh, Lee, as we wrap up, 2024 will be uh, another news heavy year. Can you just summarize for us what we can expect in terms of news flow from next gen in the first half of the year? Yeah, we're about to start our exploration program. As you're aware, uh, Arrow was discovered on one of the very first holes uh, on the on the Rook One project on, along the Patterson Corridor. Uh, we've got an enormous amount of land area to cover, um, probably be there for two decades before we fully understand the full uranium disposition on the Rook One property. So we've got two drill rigs about to commence um, uh, in the first early part of Q1. Uh, February, as I said, we're expecting an update from the CNSC with respect to our federal permitting um, uh, progress. Um, hugely material. Um, so I look forward to providing an update um, uh, at about that time. Uh, we've got site activity going on, further confirmation uh, around the geotechnical aspects of the uh, exhaust and the production shaft. The accommodation camp at, uh, at Rook One is being expanded in order in preparation to house the construction crew. So a lot of site activity going on on the ground. Um, and then also we'll be advancing uh, offtake 
uh, agreements and and um, on those terms that I mentioned earlier to to provide exposure to future uranium prices. Um, I, I, I would expect that during 2024, given the state of uh, negotiations. Uh, on top of that, uh, financing of of the project, um, the the construction financing of of the project as well. So that all um, on top of a rising uranium price. So yeah, lots happening. Uh, and, and look, we're very pleased to see the uranium price doing what it's doing. But I, I want to ensure everyone, and and this has been the culture of next gen. Even when the uranium price was so low, the focus on the process and the discipline, and and to make good decisions every day, um, irrespective of whether the market's going um, uh, poorly or or extremely well, it doesn't change anyone's disposition at next gen. We're about optimizing the outcome and what we control, and uh, and that's what investors get uh, with the team at Next Gen that that absolute resolute discipline around process and and making uh, excellent decisions. Well, it sounds like you and your team are going to be very busy this year, and I want to thank you very much for making the time, and I look forward to our next update. Always a pleasure, James. Thank you. Thank you. Curtis, thank you very much for joining us today. You are involved in a very unique aspect of the uranium fuel cycle and one we don't really think of, and that's the transportation of uranium in its various forms. And before we discuss the challenges associated with the movement of uranium, why don't we just start with a brief overview of your firm, TAM International. Where's the firm based and what services does it offer? Well, well thanks for having me, Jimmy. I appreciate it. It's, uh, like I said to you before, it's uh, a real honor to be on this. I, I know some colleagues and friends of mine who have who've been guests, and uh, no, it's great to be here to, to chat. So, yeah, TAM International is a is a specialized forwarding logistics company based in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, um, headquartered here. Started here 20 years ago, and uh, we are in, you know responsible for the global shipping of materials of radioactive nature around the world, uh, whether that be in the nuclear space with, with the uh, Uranium ore or UF6 or enriched UF6 or fuel to, uh, you know, medical isotopes and other things. So we are specialized in the, the movement of nuclear material. And uh, we're very proud to be Canadian based with offices. We also have offices in the U.S., in the U.K., in Germany, uh, Brazil and India. So, uh, yeah, we're a global company, but, uh, you know, very proudly Canadian. Uh, myself, um, I'm 20 years here and uh, I'm the chair of the World Nuclear Association Transport Working Group, as well as on the IEA uh, Denial of Shipment Working Group or Task Force Group. So uh, yeah, a long time doing this. So when it comes to transporting uranium, you're the right person to talk to. Oh, I, I like to think so. Maybe some others might disagree, but we'll see. <laughs> and just to clarify, you don't own any trucks or vessels. You're strictly a broker. No, we're not. And, you know, we are a broker in terms of we own assets in terms of material and equipment needed, whether it be overpacks or, or containers or specialized uh, products or equipment like that. But no, we don't own vessels. We don't own trucks. We uh, are very careful because of the global nature of our business. You just it, It's a practicality to form good partnerships. One of the things I find fascinating about resources in general is geopolitics, and we've seen this firsthand and how this impacts pricing in uranium. And it doesn't matter if you're talking about the war in Ukraine or Russian sanctions or the situation in Niger, they've all impacted the supply and therefore the pricing of uranium. Maybe you can just expand on or, or provide us with some details and how you deal with geopolitics and moving product from country to country and also the nuances associated with licensing and permits and also insurance yeah no it's a, a great question it's uh it's it's something it's the reason why we're in business a big part of it is because we have to understand what the geopolitics and the uh heavy regulation means to this industry um we're very fortunate to have staff on, on our team that, that follow that closely. And the geopolitics is big. It, it depends where you ship. And uranium is such an interesting commodity. It's, it's mined in so many different parts of the world. It's processed in so many different parts of the world 
that you have to have your sort of finger on the license and transit permits and, and, and all the insurance requirements that could come through for various locations, whether it be jurisdictions or whether it be commodities. Um, and, and that's a big part of it. It's, it's a delicate uh, dance we have to do, but it's one that we're very proud that we do well with our clients who work lockstep with us. So let's talk about Russia. There's been many sanctions placed on that, and Russia is a major producer of not only uranium, but also conversion and enrichment services. But what's happening in Russia right now? Is there any of these products being shipped out of Russia? Yeah, absolutely. Um, EUP, enriched uranium, is still moving. Um, uh, full disclosure, we don't do that work anymore. Uh, we, we have done that work in the past, but you know that's not something. So I'm talking to what I know as is in the general uh, scope of what's out there. So we're, for our understanding, material still moves and we're quite confident that it's going to continue. Um, back to geopolitics, we're waiting to see what happens with the sanctions that are coming through the US and what, what those look like and how that might affect the transports and, and the waivers that might be granted. Russia is moving EUP. They are also moving uranium ore. Uh, I know because Adaprom has shipped through there, uh, my understanding, even though they're Focus is the other side, but Russia is going to be a hub. But Russia is, you know, as St. Petersburg, that is the key one port that allows for two vessels in there. And, you know, when you have two lines that are only ones, one that will go to Europe and one that will try go into North America, it, it, it's a delicate dance that has to be done here in terms of uh, uh, ensuring that supply chain isn't broken or disrupted. And it's, it's something that we see is, uh, can cause a little, uh, heartburn for, for the industry if, if that if that does uh, have disruption at all. And so so there is shipping happening out of St. Petersburg. And when you say it's going to the U.S., where exactly does it go? Well, that'll be enriched uranium that will be going to the fuel fabricators, the various fuel fabricators in, in, in the U.S., whether that be in uh, Richland, Washington, or in North Carolina or South Carolina to the Westinghouse and uh, GNF facilities. That's where those will be heading to. And what port would that be shipped to? I believe it is still going through Port of Baltimore, and that is the most recent. Uh, that hasn't changed yet, so uh, that is the one they are most most likely doing. It will call Houston sometimes, but I think, believe most UP right now continues to uh, be shipped into Port of Baltimore. And when it's leaving St. Petersburg to go to Europe, what ports are they using? Uh, so Port of St. Petersburg direct. So that's a direct shipment through. There are transit issues that they can't get around right now. So that is why if you have a radioactive material, that vessel goes directly to the US. So you touched on Kazataprom in the past that they would ship their product from Kazakhstan to St. Petersburg by train. Maybe you can just touch on what's happening now. Sure. Yeah. What our understanding, you know, I, I commend Kazada Prom and they're very open about talking about this and how the work that they put into ensuring this still works. And, and yeah, in, in the past, it was a rail from uh, Kazakhstan to St. Port or St. Petersburg onto a vessel there that'd be awaiting a, a liner service. So, you know, it might have other cargo on it that helps to keep the price in check. Two, now it's the Trans Caspian route has become a very important route for, for Kazakhstan. You know, it's shipped on rail to uh, the, the Caspian Sea, across the Caspian Sea, into Azerbaijan, across into Georgia, out the port of Poti, and then across on a charter vessel. So you have a couple of vessels and you have a couple of things that are done there. And the key for those is that, you know, the consolidated amount of material to make it, you know, economically viable. You know, one of the things that we, we know here in, in the uranium industry and in radioactive, I, I use it a lot, is what makes nuclear energy great in, in terms of you don't need a lot of material to produce a massive amount of, of power. It's great for everything except logistics. There's just not a lot of buying power. You know, we don't have a lot of material in the scope of what you can see in other commodities. So it, the more you consolidate, the more you can bring it together. That's what they're doing to try and offset those costs. And because that problem's done, done a good job. It's challenging. I, and I know they'll admit that. Maybe uh, they don't want to readily admit it, but it is, it's not easy. And I, I commend them for doing the job they have because it's not, it's not easy. And when you look at two different jurisdictions, let's just say Canada versus Kazakhstan, what are some of the unique challenges associated with each jurisdiction in terms of moving the product to the end client? Sure. Yeah, no, you know, we're, I'll, I'll speak as a Canadian company with headquarters here first and 
you know, we're really we're really uh, fortunate. You know, we've got some great supports and some great carriers here in Canada, but we have challenges. We know there's ports that won't accept our material. Many ocean lines won't accept radioactive material of any kind to be shipped on their services. We have a Canadian railway that won't accept radioactive material, so we have to truck it. Um, and, and these are all just the things that we fight with. Now, that said, we've got, we've got great partners and we've got great uh, stability in terms of, you know, the carriers that we do use and, and, and they've done great work for us. But it's not straightforward. Kazakhstan, you know, they're going to have their own similar issues in terms of, you know, a, a landlocked country that has to be dependent on transiting various countries to get their material out. Um, or whether one other country, whether it be Russia, to get their material out. So you're always, um, you know, looking at, you know, you're dependent, right, on those good agreements and those, uh, you know, harmonious relationships uh, between the countries to, to allow that material to flow. And those, that's a, that's a big part of this. So we're all going to have our challenges. Um, theirs are a little more unique than ours, just to, in terms of the geography of it all. But yeah, that's those are off the top of my head. Those are two big ones. So let's talk about what's happening in the uh, Red Sea. Ships are currently being attacked, and the Suez Canal is responsible for 12 to 15 percent of global trade. What is this doing to the whole uranium industry? Well, whether it be uranium industry, the shipping industry <clears throat> in general, it's you know it, it's it's a it's a tough situation. And, and again, I don't want to lose sight or make light of you know the humanitarian aspect of this because there's a lot of connections to that, but you know, as from a strict trade, you know, global trade is affected. You know, carriers will not, you know, there's more and more diverting away. A lot of carriers won't, you know, go through the Red Sea anymore. They'll go through the other direction in terms of whether it be to the south part and uh, around Africa and up into Europe, or they'll reroute totally, you know, or they'll hold off to see what the situation is. So this is going to have a big effect. And back to what, you know, just to backtrack to what I said before about our limited resources in terms of what we have, in terms of how much we have. You know, when you're trying to negotiate room on vessels, when vessels are now being delayed 7, 10, 12 days, now you'd, you're going to come in a bit of a supply crunch. And then when the supply crunch comes, well, who gets access to those spots? You know, that's what we have to work with our clients to make sure that, you know, they're taken care of and, and, and deal with that. So that's a big part of the Red Sea Challenge. And it's going to you know, I don't want to be a pessimist, but there's nothing in, that I'm seeing that's going to show that this is going to slow down anytime soon. So we're watching it closely. We're working with our customers and our, and our suppliers, but it's, it's not going to slow down. And there's also issues going on with the Panama Canal. It's not as important when it comes to global trade. It's around 5% of uh, the global market. But maybe you can just touch on what's happening there and how that's impasse, impacting logistics. Yeah, same thing. You know, it's it, it's... It's the issues you don't think you're going to have until you have them. And, and Panama Canal is another one, especially when it's compounded with the Suez in terms of you're trying to get material through other routes. Uh, the Panama Canal is, has their locks are low on water, for a lack of a better way of putting it. Uh, the Panama Canal is fed by uh, lakes in Panama that feed into the locks to move the vessels up and down and to get the, carry the vessels across. Those vessels are you know getting hung up and, and delayed and, and and limited to get through there there's been we're reading all about auctions to jump ahead of the line or to, to move those sort of things well, that all increased costs and it depends who they are so they've dropped i believe it's around 20 percent. it was down to 40 or 50 percent at one point it's back up a bit it sounds like it had a little bit heavier of a, a wet season in november december but it's going to be an ongoing thing, and, and there's no sign that this is going to be letting up anytime soon. So, again, back to what you know, so we said when you have delays, well, there's another delay where carriers are delayed longer than you think. You they ship based on expectations of the length of their vessel and voyages, and then when they take longer, well, that ties up capacity, and then, and then the crunch is there. And I'm really surprised that you said they get their water from freshwater lakes. I just uh, would assume that it would come from the ocean. You would think there'd be a lot of water to get. You know, I. Uh, I've been learning more and more about this over the last little while. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. And when you said that there are auctions associated with going to the front of the line, what does that do to cost? How much uh, do you have to pay to go? We're to hearing numbers from one to three million dollars to for a vessel to jump the line, so they don't be the twenty-first vessel; they could be the second, because they view that as time or money well spent. Again, 
It's one thing if you have, you know, 18,000 containers on your vessel that you could spread that cost out a little better. You know, if you're, sh if you're trying to ship, you know, something at a smaller commodity level or, or quantity level, sorry, um, that cost becomes pretty dramatic. So then you wait, right? And you wait to hopefully get through and you do eventually, but that is a challenge if you're seeing. Curtis, as we wrap up, we've discussed numerous risks associated with the transportation of uranium. And uh, the one thing that really stands out to me is how fragile the whole system is and whether or not the end buyer can get the fuel that they need for their reactors. And do you foresee ongoing delivery issues or is this just another day in the life of a transporter? <laughs> I'd love to say uh, it's not just another day. There's it, it, a definite tone change over the last two years we've seen. Um, that said, we are a resilient group and we will find ways. Um, do I think that material won't get to the end users? No, I think um, we will get your material there. Will it be as straight of a line as you may have thought in the past? Maybe not. We might have to work and be creative with our customers and our clients to make sure that we find the best ways to do it and, and, and whatever that might cost, sometimes those change. But we are, we're confident we can get material moved. One of the things we have to be careful or we have continued to work on is just to educate. You know, We educate ports and ocean liners and trucking companies to, you know, beat back some of the uh, stereotypes that come with our industry. And, and Jimmy, I'm sure you know it as well as anybody when, when, they, when you speak about this industry, what's out there for stereotypes. And, and again, you can have a great carrier line that comes in that says, we want your material and we'll do it at a good price. But then if there's one port along the call of ports that says, no, you're not bringing that even through here, that cuts off the whole supply chain line. And we deal with that a lot. And uh, we deal with it the natural side, the front end, until you get into the fissile side of the rich uranium and, and fuel. You know, those are all challenges that we face. So again, are we ever we cut off totally? No, but again, I think we're all seeing the delicate nature of it. And it's I think we've all seen it pretty clearly in the last couple of years. Well, that was a great discussion. And as an investor, I never think about the complexities associated with the transporting of uranium. So I want to thank you for educating me on that. Right. And uh, I look forward to having another discussion with you at some point in the future. Anytime. Appreciate it, Jimmy. Did you know that 80% of our viewers are not subscribers to our channel? So be sure to subscribe to the channel and help us put some food on the table. Hi, Jordan. Thank you very much for joining us today. How are things in Vancouver? Things are good here in Vancouver. Thank you very much for having me again. I'm very much looking forward to catching up and providing an update on Sky Harbor. And I'm looking forward to get the, to getting an update. How are the skiing conditions? Uh, they're, they're better now. It's uh, snowing here in the city, uh, which is great for the mountains, but uh, it was certainly a slow start to the season for most of the mountains near. Yeah, I think that's been the case right across North America. So let's get an update on Sky Harbor now. You have 25 projects, all of which are in the Athabasca Basin, and your focus has been on two of the larger projects, Russell Lake and Moore Lake, both of which are advanced staged exploration projects. And I wanna start with an update on Russell Lake. You and your team actually completed an inaugural drill program in 2023, 9,600 meters. Maybe you can just give us an overview or uh, the highlights of that drill program. Yeah, absolutely. So when we last spoke in October, uh, we we were just wrapping up this inaugural 9,600 meter drill program. The first drill program carried out at Russell Lake in uh, almost a decade. Uh, so it was an exciting program for us. Uh, we intersected some of the strongest uranium mineralization uh, that had ever been discovered at the project. Most of the drilling that we carried out was focused at the grayling target, this main grayling conductive corridor. Uh, most of the holes that we drilled intersected mineralized uranium mineralization at this target. Uh, so it's given us a, a very good idea of where we need to go back into. We've, uh, over the last several months, uh, gone back and uh, uh, done some remodeling. We've we've put uh, our geologists have put the project through very rigorous uh, analysis and 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 target selection, and we've identified a, a number of new uh, uh, and additional targets at this main conductive corridor. It's a multi-kilometer long corridor uh, that actually loops around and trends onto Denison's Wheeler River project. 
Uh, Denison, as I think most uh, of the listeners are aware, is one of our largest shareholders and a strategic partner uh, of, of Sky Harbors and their flagship Wheeler River project is adjacent to the west of this Russell Lake project. Uh, so uh, we're gonna uh, go right back into this grayling target area, in particular, the grayling east target area. And uh, before we get into uh, the specifics on the upcoming uh, drill program, just to highlight again, uh, the significance and, and strategic importance of the Russell Lake project, uh, which is currently under option, we can earn up to 100% of this project from Rio Tinto. We're nearing completion of this initial 51% earn in. We'll, we'll be complete that here uh, within the next several months as we uh, complete this upcoming winter program. It's a very large advanced stage exploration asset uh, that uh, has numerous uh, highly prospective targets throughout. Uh, it also is host uh, on the Western Plains to the the road that services the MacArthur River mine to the north uh, power lines and there's an exploration camp as well uh, that we're utilizing at the projects which brings our uh, exploration and drill costs down quite significantly. So uh, first of all there's a lot to unpack there but I want to first of all ask about Rio Tinto. They're the owner of this project but are they involved at all in any of the decision making? Um, right now, we're the operator and, and will continue to be as we earn in. And ultimately, once we've earned a majority interest in the project, we'll remain the operator. But yes, we do uh, include them in the decision-making process. Uh, they, they worked on the project for a number of years after they acquired it uh, from Hathor um, upon acquiring the company uh, back in 2012. And so they know the rocks uh, very well. We, we've worked with them. They're needless to say a great partner to have one of the largest diversified mining companies uh, in the world. Uh, they're a large shareholder of Sky Harbor. And the way the earn in works, as I mentioned, we're nearing completion of that initial 51% interest. We can earn then, we can continue on to earn a, a 70%. And then we have an option to buy them out through a large uh, cash and share balloon payment to get to 100%. So at the end of the day, uh, in all likelihood, Rio will either be a, a joint venture partner and large shareholder of the company, or they'll continue to be a much larger shareholder uh, of the company as we continue to earn more interest in the project. And you made mention of the fact that Russell Lake is close to infrastructure. You also have access to a camp, so therefore it reduced your drilling costs. Um, what, are, what are your drilling costs all in? Meter. Yeah, I mean that. Look, that's uh, been uh, the, the, a great um, part of carrying out this initial drill program. Is really getting a lay of the land. We were able to bring our drill costs in well below three hundred dollars Canadian, all in, all in a meter. That's including everything and uh, a lot of other projects, exploration projects that are more remote, uh, aren't road accessible uh, in the Athabasca Basin. I mean, they can run as high as five, six, seven hundred dollars all in. A meter. So having the road, having the power lines, having uh, the exploration camp uh, uh, that we're utilizing, it's a it's a big asset of the project that we are inheriting uh, as a part of uh, this earn-in. Uh, that makes a big difference. It makes a big difference at Russell going forward. We we can drill a lot more holes for the same amount of money in this upcoming program. Uh, the three target main target areas that we're going to be drill testing this winter are all road accessible, but it also benefits uh, our nearby projects. And uh, a part of this winter drill campaign, uh, 8,000 meters combined between Russell Lake and Moore Lake, 5,000 at Russell and 3,000 at Moore, uh, we are gonna be utilizing that camp when we carry out the 3,000 meters of drilling over at Moore Lake. We can skid the rig over uh, in the winter here. And so that also brings our drill costs down uh, at the adjacent co-flagship Moore Lake project. And so you touched on that you're gonna start up a winter drill program. When is that gonna happen? I think you said 5,000 meters? Yeah, so we've just announced the plans for that program. Um, it'll be commencing uh, very, very shortly, um, and it's 8,000 meters of drilling. Again, 5,000 of that me of those meters will be carried out at Russell. 3,000 meters will be carried out at Moore. It's the first time in our history where we'll be 
advancing both of these co-flagship projects simultaneously. So this is very exciting for us and our shareholders. It'll generate a lot of news flow uh, over the coming months. Now the 5,000 meters at Russell, uh, we've identified three high priority targets, the Grayling East Zone, which is the extension of that main Grayling conductive corridor over to the east. It's been sporadically drill tested. There's mineralization there. Uh, and uh, it's a target that uh, over the last several months we've refined and we've got specific um, drill targets now selected. So we'll drill 1,500 to 2,000 meters there. We're then planning to drill um, a target area called the, the fork zone, which is uh, just to the west of the main grayling um, conductor. It's within that broader grayling target area. It's actually the extension of uriniferous conductive corridors trending from the adjacent Wheeler River project. Uh, and then the last uh, and third and final uh, target area that we'll be drill testing is uh, called the M zone extension. Now this is a little bit further to the north. Uh, it's just off of the road. Um, and uh, what's very exciting about this target uh, is we, we didn't get a chance to go and drill test uh, this target area in the 2023 program. It's a high priority target. Again, there's been sporadic drilling there uh, historically, previously. Uh, there is mineralization. It's the continuation, again, of, of uriniferous corridors that trend from Denison's adjacent Wheeler River project. Uh, but you've also got these east-west trending cross structures that trend right from Wheeler onto Russell. And this lines right up with those cross structures uh, that are associated with the Phoenix and Griffin deposits at the Wheeler River project. So uh, again, a very exciting target for us to, to go and drill test. Uh, each one of these three targets will likely drill 1,500 to 2,000 meters. The total 5,000 meters will be in 10 to 12 drill holes. And then we're planning uh, probably sometime late February, early March to move the rig over to our Moore Lake project. And as we talked about last time, Moore Lake is the most advanced stage project that we have in our portfolio. It's host to high-grade uranium mineralization. It's several pods or several lenses and zones of mineralization on what's called the Maverick Corridor. Um, what's, what's great about this program is a part of this program uh, it includes infill and definition drilling right at that main high-grade Maverick zone. We actually haven't gone back and drilled um, much at that main Maverick zone for some time now. Uh, this main Maverick zone is host to mineralization, uh, very high grade mineralization, historical and previous drilling that we carried out years ago in 2017 and 2018, including drill results as high as 21% U308 over a meter and a half. That was, was, was within six meters of 6% 6 U308. Uh, so we're, we're, we're keen to go back in there and, and look to expand the, that main high grade zone. Uh, we're also gonna be drill testing some of the regional targets, including the grid 19 target just up to the Northeast from uh, the main Maverick and Maverick East zones. The project we feel has a lot more more upside exploration and discovery upside potential. Yes, there's some notable high-grade mineralization at that main Maverick and Maverick East zones that we've been drill testing uh, over the last five to six years, but there's also a lot of uh, exploration discovery potential remaining in the underlying basement rocks. We intersected just a few years ago the, uh, a new discovery, a high-grade zone of 7% U308 over two meters um, that was uh, that was in the underlying basement rocks at the Maverick East Zone. So there's still a lot of blue sky potential at Moore Lake. Uh, but yes, it is host to this high grade zone, uh, several high grade zones. And as we talked about last time, uh, we are uh, still working on a, a resource estimate. We're expecting to have that out uh, at some point uh, in uh, the, the Q1 or Q2 of this year. Uh, and part and parcel with that will be uh, the the uh, definition and infill drilling of that main high grade zone at the main Maverick zone. So uh, 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 8,000 meter total program, five at Russell, three at Moore. We're fully funded for this. Uh, we raised money late last year. We've got about 10 million in the treasury. This 8,000 meters will cost about three to three and a half million. Um, and it'll take us right into April, May. Uh, lots of news flow over the course of that. Uh, three to five months, and then we are fully funded to follow up uh, with summer and fall drill programs as well.
Jordan, another interesting component of Sky Harbor is this project generator model. And one of the great features of this, this model is that you don't have to put up one penny for exploration work, your partners do. But maybe you can just go through some of your partners, who they are and what they're working on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is a growing part of our business. Uh, it's uh, something that uh, I think we will continue to uh, execute on this year. We're getting a lot of inbound interest currently um, as the market, the uranium market continues to heat up and, and uh, companies are interested in acquiring projects uh, in the Athabasca Basin. So we've signed eight separate option agreements. Um, two of those now are joint venture partners, one with the RANO, France's largest uranium mining and nuclear fuel company. They're now a joint venture partner at the Preston Project, which is over on the western side of the Athabasca Basin, just south of, of, of uh, 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 Triple R and Aero. Um, that project, for the first time in a number of years, uh, is going to be worked on uh, this uh, coming year. Uh, we are electing to participate in that as a, a JV partner, minority interest holder. Uh, so it's great to see Arano uh, getting back to work there. The other uh, joint venture partner that completed their earn-in is Azincourt. They've been very active advancing the East Preston project, which is adjacent to Preston. Uh, they too have plans for additional drilling and exploration this year, uh, just waiting to get the, the, the final budget and plans for that project. And then the other six option agreements that we've signed over the course of the last several years, uh, four, we're expecting at least three, probably four of these six option partners uh, will be uh, actively advancing their respective projects uh, this year. They need to spend money in the field as a part of their earn-in terms. Uh, and just to recap, collectively, all of these option uh, agreements that we've signed total to over 80 million in combined project consideration, assuming that these companies all complete uh, their earnings, uh, the full earnings. Uh, about half of that uh, is in exploration funding uh, coming entirely from the partner companies and the other half in cash and in stock uh, that's uh, paid and issued to us annually, uh, again, as they earn in. Uh, so like I said, three, maybe four of these uh, part, uh, option partners uh, that we're expecting to carry out uh, work programs this year, starting with uh, two newer option partners, Tisdale Clean Energy at our South Falcon East project, which is host to the Fraser Lakes Zone B deposit, a, a shallow uh, deposit inferred resource uh, that's open for expansion along strike and a depth. Uh, Tisdale is planning a, a winter drill program uh, to go right back in and, and expand that zone of mineralization and, and, and looking to make new discoveries. Uh, very, very excited uh, for that. We actually spent um, a fair bit of money on that project in previous years. We drilled it previously and we, we were intersecting higher grade mineralization at depth. So there's a lot of upside left at that project. Uh, Tisdale can earn um, uh, a majority interest in that project by spending a combined 22 million uh, over the next uh, several years. And again, in, in project and in, in exploration funding and in cash and share payments as well. There's a lot uh, going on, a lot to look forward to, not just at Russell and Moore, but with a handful of our partner companies. Again, the, the, the companies that are still earning in as a part of an option earn in are required to fund these programs entirely. Uh, so it's a, it's a much uh, less dilutive means for us to uh, offer our investors exposure, not just to uh, discovery and resource expansion potential at Russell and more, but to offer that at these other projects as well uh, as these other companies come in and fund the work. So multiple irons in the fire, as I've said before, you know, we're really trying to build Sky Harbor out to be that one-stop shop for high-grade uranium exploration and discovery in the Athabasca Basin across multiple projects throughout the Athabasca Basin with multiple operators uh, moving these projects forward. So, as you mentioned, you have a lot going on at both Russell Lake and Moore Lake. So, let's move on and discuss your balance sheet. You did touch on this earlier, but I just want to go through it again. How much cash do you have on hand and how will you allocate that cash in the coming year? Yeah, we are fully funded, as I mentioned earlier, for at least 2024. Um, we, we raised just over $6 million 
uh, in a, a charity flow through financing and flow through financing late last year. It was just a a, a few strategic institutional investors that that participated in it, um, and uh, the the front end price being in the high seventy. In the high 70s, so it was uh, good terms, and um, it uh, provides the funding for uh, this winter program, uh, 8,000 meters at Russell, and more. A little bit going towards um, uh, some of the the, JV, the the two JV projects uh, potentially this year as well, um, and then it also provides the funding for summer and fall drill programs as well. So uh, we're in good shape. Uh, the total uh, treasury is now at just over 10 million. Um, and uh, and as I've mentioned before, with the cash and share payments coming in from the option partners as they continue to earn in, that'll continue to bolster our treasury. We haven't had to raise a hard dollar in a in an equity financing since August of 2020, and a big part of that um, has been uh, the cash in stock uh, that's come in from these uh, option partners. And on that note, we are in uh, very advanced negotiations uh, on some of the other 100% owned projects that we have in the Athabasca Basin. We're the third largest. Uh, mineral tenure holder in northern Saskatchewan uh, with over 1.2 million acres as you pointed out 25 properties um, we're working on two of those and we've optioned or JV'd out another nine of those so uh, we've got plenty of other 100% owned projects uh, that uh, certainly right now with the market doing what it's doing uranium price continuing to move higher I expect we'll be able to announce additional new partners and option agreements uh, in the coming months Jordan, as we wrap up, you've provided a lot of information on what investors can expect here in the coming months from Sky Harbor. Maybe you can just summarize the main points. Yeah, absolutely. So um, again, embarking on our uh, largest single season drill campaign, first time ever that we're gonna be um, simultaneously advancing our two co-flagship Russell and Moore Lake projects that combined 8,000 meters uh, over the coming several months. So that'll provide lots of news flow uh, over those months uh, as we work our way into the summer months. Um, we're fully funded to continue drilling at both projects. We have a resource estimate slated to come out on Moore Lake. Uh, we've continued to expand uh, and grow our project portfolio. Uh, most of these acquisitions coming in through online staking uh, and a couple of other property deals we've done with some other companies. Uh, these, these new projects and, cl and mineral claims will add to that prospect generator inventory and portfolio that we have. Keep an eye out for additional news flow on new partner companies as well as the existing partners uh, that I went through that are planning to uh, either carry out drill programs or larger field programs uh, over the coming six to 12 months. Uh, it's gonna be our most active year. It's gonna be a very catalyst rich year. And I think the timing again with the uranium market couldn't be better. Uh, it's a very exciting time to be uh, a, an, an exploration company and a prospect generator company uh, as we're seeing this uranium price move higher. I, I think uh, we will also see the equities outperform this year. I think there's some catching up for the smaller and mid cap names to do and uh, we're well positioned uh, in the Athabasca Basin uh, to uh, offer exposure, uh, investors exposure to these rising uranium prices. Well, Jordan, that was a great overview, and I want to thank you very much for spending time with us today. And it sounds like you and your team are going to be very busy here in the coming months. And I look forward to the next update. Thank you very much. I very much appreciate it, Jimmy, and we'll chat soon. Rick, thank you very much for joining us today. I'm looking forward to this discussion. The last time we spoke, it was a very broad discussion on resources, but today I want to focus exclusively on uranium. So my apologies to all the gold bugs out there. After all, uranium was the top performing commodity in 2023, up over 80%. And you've been involved in the uranium sector for many years now. You've witnessed a few different cycles. And I want to start right here and get your thoughts on how this cycle compares to the cycle that we saw in the early 2000s. Well, that's, that's a great question. By the way, thank you for having me back. I'm a James Conner and a Bloor Street Capital fan, so I'm, I'm delighted to be back with you. But back to the question. 
Uh, I suspect that this cycle will be more muted than the prior cycle in the sense that the prior cycle occurred at the end of a 20-year bear market. And there was simply no capacity to increase supply as a consequence of a 20-year bear market. Uh, this market, to be sure, has room to run because the simple fact that the uranium price has gone to $100 a pound doesn't increase supply. Uh, you need to find mines, you need to permit mines, you need to meet, bring mines back under production. I would suggest in the next 18 months that supply will grow between 15 and 20 million pounds per annum from the restarts of both the Kazatom Prom and the Cameco hot stopped projects. It's important to note, though, that both companies have said that they won't restart uh, idled capacity uh, until they have enough material contact contracted for long enough in the term market that they earn a reasonable return on, uh, on uh, shareholders' capital. So I think what you're going to see is pricing discipline. The other thing about this market compared to the last market that's better than the last market is that we're seeing in this market uh, a, a real return to prominence of the term market over the spot market. In the last market, both producers and consumers were hampered with no price certainty. What we're seeing very recently, perhaps as a consequence of, of Sprott buying up most of the surplus inventory that was available in the spot market, is that most transactions today are taking place in the term market. These term market uh, offtake agreements give producers certainty uh, around the pricing that they sell their material for. And they do the same thing for the utilities. But that also increases the visibility of the free cash flow to the producer, and it makes uh, production financing easier to occur than would otherwise happen. What I think you're going to be able to see is that uh, companies that wouldn't necessarily otherwise be able to obtain production financing, uh, if they have term agreements with investment quality offtakers, Duke Power, the Southern Company, Ontario Hydro, They'll be able to take those agreements uh, to financial intermediaries like Sprott or Orion or the Royal Bank of Canada and uh, projects that would have been unfinanceable in the last cycle, I think will be financeable in this cycle. So it will be different in the sense that there is more expertise. Uh, there is the benefit of the exploration that occurred last cycle. Uh, but the financial structure that we're going to see in the uranium business for the next 10, 10 or 20 years is going to be, from an investor standpoint, much, much, much more sustainable. Yeah, all very good points. The The other element that I would I want to bring to your attention is I also lived through that last cycle, but there was a level of speculation then that I don't see now. Like there was hundreds of these junior companies. Would you agree with that? You made a really good point, uh, and I I think that's healthy. In the last cycle, if you measure from trough to peak, the number of junior companies involved in the uranium business increased from five, I own them all, to 500. Now, to put that in perspective, the number of teams capable of running a uranium company at the beginning of the cycle after a 20-year bear market was in my estimation between 10 and 15. At the beginning of the cycle, you had five companies competing for 15 management teams. Pretty good arithmetic. At the end of the cycle, you had 500 companies competing for 15 teams. Pretty bad arithmetic. Uh, in that sense, uh, this market is much more sensible. At last count, there are 81 companies purporting to be in the uranium space with still 15, perhaps 20 teams now capable of running a uranium company. So the probability that your junior has access to high quality leadership is now one in four or one in five, down from something more like one in 50 at the peak of the last cycle. It's a much, much, much healthier circumstance out there. Of the 81 companies that we see on a global basis that purport to be in the uranium business, uh, we think as many as 15 of them are relatively attractive. Uh, while that doesn't sound like a great headline number, if you compare it with the length and breadth of the junior mining market, it is fairly attractive. 
Very good points. And I guess something else we should that that might be a little bit different this time too is the geopolitics. Of course, we have the we still have the fallout from the war in Ukraine and also the sanctions placed against Russia. And then, you know, even the situation that's happening within the Red Sea, right? This is causing shipping delays and the movement of uranium throughout the world. But can you speak to that? I think that's a bigger story than uranium. Uh, I think if you look back over the last 40 years, that we've benefited from a time of historically low global tensions. Uh, and I think that's true across commodities. What we're beginning to see now is the end of that era, which is unfortunate. Uh, you are looking, as an example, at the, the continued ascent of China. And China is doing precisely what the United States and Western Europe did in the 50s and 60s. They're looking to secure access to supply. That's what the Japanese did in the 70s or 80s. The Chinese aren't doing anything that we didn't do. But there's increasing competition. At the same time, as you suggest, uh, that the outlook in geopolitics is becoming less friendly. Now, thus far, with regards to uranium, Despite the fact that we're hostile to the Russians, American imports of uh, reprocessed uranium uh, increased by 50% last year. <laughs> Thus far, uh, we seem to have sanctions where nobody gets hurt. Uh, I suspect that the United States and Canada, among others, would like enrichment and re-enrichment capacity that isn't Russian. Uh, it's very, very clear to me, too, that the U.S. is looking for, whether it's smart or not, geopolitical security around supply of uranium. Uh, I personally believe that we have access, if we pay the right price, to Canadian uranium. That notwithstanding, our Congress seems to feel different. And while five years ago, as recently as five years ago, they were extremely hostile to uranium, now the U.S. Congress has decided to subsidize it. Uh, that says something about the perception of geopolitically of the geopolitical importance of uranium. I think the the best testimony though to that James occurs by watching the Japanese actions. As a consequence of the Arab oil embargo in the early part of the 1970s, Japan Inc came to the not so stunning conclusion that they needed energy security. And the only material that they could store enough of to power Japan was uranium. The energy density of uranium meant that Japan went from a standing start, an anti-nuclear country as a consequence of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, to having the second largest nuclear fleet in the world, specifically around energy security. The Japanese could store in one warehouse enough uranium to supply electricity to all of Japan for five years. You couldn't store that much coal, that much oil, that much natural gas, and you couldn't certainly couldn't store that much uh, that much rain. Importantly, uh, in terms of geopolitics and in terms of the carbon-free generation of baseload power, uh, the big thinkers in the world, irrespective of their uh, thoughts about uranium five years ago, have turned to it as a, a, a way to solve both geopolitical and carbon problems. Yeah, very good point. And it's almost, you, you've raised a great point about what happened in Japan and now what's happening in China. And it's almost as if the U.S. policymakers are totally oblivious to this because the Chinese, the one thing they do very well, they think long term. They're thinking 25, 50, 75 years out, whereas we in the West or in North America, we tend to think about this week, next week, next month, right? We're very short-sighted. And given that the U.S. is the world's largest importer or, or um, user of uranium, I believe it's 50 million pounds a year, 20% of its grid comes from nuclear energy, you'd think they would be a lot more aggressive in acquiring it and trying to get ahead of the curve. I think you've been too polite towards U.S. policymakers, uh, ironically. I think they think as far as the next election cycle, and I think much more than other people realize, they think towards campaign contributions. Uh, H.L. Mencken famously said about uh, American politics uh, that elections were advanced auctions of stolen property. Uh, and I suspect if you're looking for long-term policy out of American policymakers, your long-term perspective is no longer than the presidential election cycle, which is four years. Sad but true. Yes, yes. I uh... Well, I can say the same thing about the country I live in. 
Anyhow, that's a that's a good overview of the macro. Why don't we dive in now to the micro? And I want to focus more on uh, your selection process and how you invest as an investor. You're you're famous for that, mm -hmm. and and I want to get a sense of how you invest. Are you looking? Are you just buying the Sprott Physical Trust? Are you looking at producers, developers, explore codes? What's your portfolio look like? In my experience, commodity bull markets follow a predictable pattern, which is to say the commodity moves first. So if you had asked me three years ago what I was doing, that was pretty simple. I thought that the uranium price had to go from 20 to some number like 75. And the lowest risk to do the lowest risk for way for me to play that was the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. I <laughs> I had no operational risk. Uh, I, I had no human resources risk. I had no political risk. All I had to do was buy uranium and throw it in a warehouse. And in fact, Sprott would do it for me. Uh, so my portfolio, uh, upon us taking over the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust from UPC, was simply to buy that vehicle. I believe the commodity had to go up. And the most direct way to play the game was to buy the commodity, which I did. It was wonderful. Uh, the uranium price doesn't have to go up anymore, although I think it will. Uh, I think that the market misunderstands the importance of the structure of the uranium market going from a spot market to a term market. And I think that the market doesn't understand the level of earnings visibility that the companies will enjoy three years from now or four years ago. So I believe that some of the companies, particularly because they've lagged the uranium price in the last six months, uh, offer the ability to be very, very good five to seven year holds. Make no mistake, the easy money in the uranium juniors has been made. When a commodity goes from hated to tolerated uh, to attractive, the easy money is off the table. Uh, and the fact that the sort of 15 uranium juniors that we follow are uniformly up three or four hundred percent has made it incumbent on me to sell enough of those positions that I recaptured my capital investment uh, and I sold enough too to pay the capital gains on the recapture. The easy money has been made. What you look at now uh, will be structurally improved companies. There'll be companies like Cameco that not only increase their production by 15 million pounds, but increase that production with minimum sales prices locked in for 15 years. The stability in terms of free cash flow that this gives Cameco and the uh, visibility in terms of forward earnings that this gives Bay Street when they're analyzing uh, Cameco means that the whole landscape around uranium equity investing has changed and changed remarkably for the better. In terms of what I look for in a junior, I start with relevant experience in uranium. If a company is headed by somebody who has failed in crypto, failed in gold, and failed in marijuana, uh, there's a high probability that he or she is going to fail in uranium too. And I would prefer that they didn't take me with them. Mercifully, having been in the uranium business now for almost 40 years, most of the people who have, who have enjoyed success over the last 40 years are people I've bumped into. So I start there. Uh, I, unlike many, uh, really like scale. Uh, I am not somebody who is particularly attracted to the idea that you use the cash flow from a small high-grade mine and grow your company. While that's attractive to entrepreneurs, I've noticed that statistically it's an improbability. Uh, if you're going to take the risks inherent in junior companies, I want the rewards to be commensurate with the risks. So specifically, I don't care at all about a deposit that doesn't exhibit two and a half to three billion dollars in in situ recoverable reserves and resources already defined. I don't care about small deposits. I don't want to know about small deposits. Mercifully, in the uranium space, there's a whole bunch of big deposits that people don't care particularly about, which I'm attracted to. The best, of course, and I'm not saying that this is an investment recommendation, but the incredible discovery made by NextGen uh, in the Athabasca Basin. This is a world-scale deposit by anybody's estimation. If it wasn't a uranium deposit, if it was a sand and gravel deposit, 
that was in the lowest cost quartile worldwide, had the highest return on capital employed, best, you know, best quartile return on capital employed worldwide. Uh, you'd have to be interested in it. The fact that it's in the Iranian business makes it more interesting. Uh, the fission deposit next door attracts me. Uh, a, because it meets my size criterion, but B, because whoever builds the next gen deposit will likely have to build the, the fission deposit simultaneously. Why would you do duplicate overhead, uh, you know, duplicate infrastructure 300 miles away from any infrastructure? Sidebar, of course, the industry built uh, two diamond mines <laughs> in the Northwest Territories, 19 kilometers apart, and they did build duplicate infrastructure. But I'm hoping the uranium business won't be as stupid as a diamond business was. But the, f the fact is that there are five or six deposits on a global basis that don't need to get any bigger. Uh, they need to be advanced. Uh, they need to be advanced with term contracts and financed. And I don't think that the market is understanding well enough uh, the fact that unusually these are almost annuity style uh, exercises. There is also, uh, I think, better technology, particularly in the Athabasca Basin, uh, with regards to remote sensing, with regards to targeting. And I think that you're going to see an exploration renaissance in uranium. Uh, those companies haven't been identified to me yet, but I'm paying particular attention to the application of technology in the hands of very skilled technologists. Uh, so I, I think there's all kinds of opportunity there. Having said that, I need to say that with the juniors, the easy money, easy money has been made. Uh, to make the easy money, you have to pick a hated commodity and uranium is no longer a hated commodity. So when you look at Explore Close, if I was to summarize all that, number one, you look at the management team. Number two, you look for size and scale. I do. And I look at a disconnect. Uh, if the company's undervalued, I want to know why it's undervalued. If I look at a company, as an example, it has a big deposit in Namibia, and I can allay the lack of market cap to the misperception of political risk on the part of investors, I get that. If I understand what the problem is, uh, I uh, actually feel better about the problem. I can make up my own mind as to whether the, the the market is right or wrong about Namibia. I have to understand from my own point of view what I think the problem is. Now, another point that you made was the fact that you start with the physical and the physical has put in a massive move. It's probably up 100%, give or take, since this time last year. But a lot of the stocks aren't really moving in line with that. They're pricing in a much lower uranium price. So I guess my question to you is, do you think the spot market has gotten ahead of itself and it's being driven by exog exogenous factors? Or do you think there's good value to be found in some of these explorer codes and developers? Uh, I, I think the spot market may be ahead of itself, but I think it's important to note that it takes a long time to bring new production online. And two things have changed. One, 50 million pounds of uranium went to supply heaven because Sprott bought it. So that overhang isn't there. The rest of the overhang on the spot uh, market was Japanese product. When the Japanese shut down their nuclear fleet, their inventory uh, became available for sale. Now that the Japanese have restarted their nuclear fleet, that supply has gone to supply heaven too. So the spot market is way, way, way undersupplied and won't be able to be supplied at all until you see a restart of Kazatom, Prom, and Cameco. And that won't happen until those companies have satisfied themselves in the term market that they can get a reasonable return on capital employed for restarting their hot stopped projects. This is a wonderful circumstance. So although the incentive price for new production at today's interest rates is probably $75 or $80 US, uh, and the spot market at $105 more than discounts the incentive price, the incentive price won't result in new production for between five and seven years <laughs> because it takes that long to build to build a deposit. As the volume shifts, as it must, because the spot market's undersupplied to the term market, that makes successful effort discoveries 
uh, and development much, much, much more financeable uh, than would occur uh, in the old days where all the transactions were taking place in the spot market. And I don't think that investors have grasped this uh, positive change in fundamentals. Now, it's true that many, many of the Canadian speculators uh, or, or the people who speculate in the very junior mining stocks don't care particularly about the reality uh, of construction financing or the differentials between the term market and the spot market. They're interested in sex. They're interested in momentum, all that kind of stuff. At 70 years old, I dare say I'm too old to care too much about sex. I care much more about money. Uh, but I do think that the perception around the uranium market will not return to the frenzied levels we saw in the last bull, bull market precisely because uh, people were punished so severely for being overly optimistic. You'll recall that we went from having five companies in the junior space to having 500 companies in the junior space to falling to having 35 companies uh, in the junior space. You'll remember, too, that we had a boomlet market, 2019, 2020, 2021. Those speculators who bought the uranium narrative didn't understand that that uranium narrative would take five or six years to play out. Their investment horizons were a long weekend, uh, and they were disappointed. And so you have two different sets of investors whose perceptions around the market were false, but whose perceptions around the market uh, formed their expectations of the market, which are by now very low. The next range of investors over the next five years uh, are going to be uncommon mining investors. They're going to be rational. Uh, they are going to look for deposits in the lowest quartile of the cost curve. They're going to look for returns on capital employed at normalized pricing, $75 uranium, that exceed 25% per annum. They are going to look to have 60 or 70 percent of production bound up in term contracts for 10 years so that the loans involved in construction can be amortized, leaving room left over for shareholders. In other words, the next generation of uranium investors is going to be competent at math. Rick, you made mention of the fact that the easy money in the juniors has already been made. But what would you tell an investor who has yet to get involved in the uranium market? And, you know, they, they say, ah, oh, I'm too late. It's already gone up 100, 200, 300 percent. It depends on who you are. Uh, it is a truism that most speculators don't care about a commodity when they ought to be buying it. Uh, it is a truism that the narrative around uranium wasn't apparent to most investors until the price was such that the narrative became less valuable. That's just the way it works. If you're a momentum investor, uh, if what you are looking to do is take advantage of a commodity where somebody later than you is even dumber than you are, uh, the uranium space is no longer for you. You're a year late. Uh, don't get near it. If you are looking for a business that will prosper by providing baseload power, carbon-free baseload power to humanity uh, at a pricing level that can give you 25 to 35 uh, percent returns on capital employed, then the uranium business is for you. Uh, I would say for a rational natural resource speculator or a, nas a rational uh, resource investor that the game is early on. I'm prepared to say that the uranium price has gone as far as it needs to go in the next year. I'm not, pro I, I'm not projecting a precipitous decline, but it wouldn't surprise me to see the spot price decline. Uh, I, I think that investors in the uranium space now need to confine their expectations to reality. Uh, they need to pay attention to things like optimized economics between pre-feasibility study and bankable feasibility study. They need to pay attention to the boring stuff like permitting uh, and financing. They need to pay attention to the structure of term contracts. Uh, for many resource investors, this is mind-numbing and boring. They would prefer to call their broker and be lied to. Uh, but for the real investors, for the real speculators, uh, 
there is a real step change, a real transformational change occurring in the Iranian business that will take some of those 15 companies that I said I think are viable uh, and, and transform them into, uh, I would say, truly spectacular advanced speculations. Uh, these are companies that don't have to go out and find anything. It's been found. These are companies that are valued based on $50 yellow cake in the spot market as opposed to $75 or $80 yellow cake, never mind $100 yellow cake in the term market. These are companies that won't be subject too much to the vagaries of the spot price because their offtake will be contractually sold to investment credit grade counterparties. <laughs> Uh, this is different than anything that we have seen in the uranium market, or frankly, anything that we have seen in any other commodity market in my career. It's unlikely to see, it's unusual to see oil companies or gas companies sell most of their production in volumetric production payments forward. So it's unlikely for companies, even as stable as oil and gas companies, to enjoy the predictability of product pricing that you're going to see in the uranium business. For the next five to 10 years. And, and that certainty and the visibility of that certainty will change the nature of uranium speculation. Rick, I want to get your sense now of what you're hearing from investors. You travel all over North America and also Europe, speaking to investors all the time, both retail and institutional. And, and what's your sense? Do we still have a long way to go in this trade? And I, I guess if I was to use a baseball analogy, what inning do you think we're in? I think we're probably in the fourth inning. Uh, I I suspect that we've come so far so fast that we need a breather. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I think we probably need a breather. Even Cameco, which I'm really attracted to, has moved from, what, eight to 40? Uh, that's a pretty good move. You know, a, a four-bagger uh, in three years is a pretty good move. And, and the market probably needs to digest these gains. Uh, two, I think that people need to be attracted to uranium for long enough that they get deep enough into it uh, that they can comprehend or care to comprehend the transition that the market is seeing from spot to term. Uh, a, a whole bunch of people are attracted to uranium merely because the price has gone up. Then they say to themselves, if the price has gone up, why does it need to go higher? Uh, they need to familiarize themselves with the nitty gritty of the business before they become excited again. But the business is going to be such a good business, uh, such a cash flow generative business, that I think reality will take care of perception over the five-year time frame. Over the 18-month time frame, probably not. Now, as you say, I talk to 80,000 investors worldwide who are subscribers of mine uh, at Rural Investment Media. Some of them express outright hostility when I say that the easy money has been made. Uh, I suspect because they came late to it. Uh, the price action in uranium has now justified the narrative that I was trying to sell them three and a half years ago. But what I'm seeing with the family offices, the high quality investors, most of whom, by the way, aren't in the mining business. I know them from the oil and gas business or the timber business. When I sit down with the family offices and I take them through the structural change of the uranium business, when I explain the uranium business as a business, uh, not as a ticker symbol uh, on the TSX. Uh, if I explain the changing dynamics of the uranium business to somebody who built their fortune owning lumber mills and talk about the changing structure of the industry, the light bulbs go off. Uh, you know, you can just watch them say, oh, right. Ultimately, stock prices follow value. A and value creation is changing here in a step fashion manner. So in that sense, uh, I, I'm seeing real uptake. I'm, I, I mean, anytime I wanted now, uh, I could call Rio Tinto or BHP or China General Nuclear, and I could get a return phone call. But the truth is, I don't know anything they don't know. <laughs> so there's no particular point in, uh, in me calling them. Uh, where the change is going to come is in the middle market. 
Rick, as we wrap up, I'm going to put you on the spot now. And this is one of the reasons why I enjoy talking with you because it's such a free flowing conversation. But the last time we spoke, uranium was at $70. Now it's over $100 a pound. A year from now, where do you think it's going to be? I actually, I, I'm not ducking the question. I actually have no idea. The price of uranium doesn't have to go higher. I expect uh, that from a broker, Rick, not from you. This, this, is, uh, this is at a price uh, where uh, the price is plenty high enough at these interest rates to incent new production, but it's going to take time to incent new production. I, I think what's going to be a more important question is what will the contracting volumes in the term market look like over the next three years? Because the spot market is an increasing anachronism. It's important in that it shapes the narrative, but it's unimportant in terms of return on capital employed. Uh, the spot market isn't where most of the transactions are taking place. Uh, and it isn't a market where buyers or sellers express their preference going forward. That's taking place in the term market. The term market is very opaque right now. It's tough even for somebody like me to get information about the structure of individual contracts between, say, Cameco and Duke Power. But that's what you're going to have to do. So while I have absolutely no idea where the spot price is going to be, uh, increasingly I care less because the outcome of the investments that I'm making in the next five-year uh, time frame won't be determined in the spot market. They'll be determined in the term market. Uh, and by the way, that wasn't a neat exercise in ducking your question. Uh, it was just to say that the way I think uh, probably reflects the fact that the spot market is a variable that's important in people's minds, but isn't important in terms of the outcome of their investments. Well, Rick, that was a great discussion. And I want to thank you very much for spending time with us today. If someone would like to learn more about you and the various services that you and your firm offer, where can they go? Uh, thank you for that. Uh, go to Rural Investment Media. Uh, if you like the way I think about natural resources, you can access it personalized for free. Uh, go to Rural Investment Media, list your natural resource stocks, and I personally will rank them one to 10, one being best, 10 being worst. If I have an opinion about one of your companies that I think is worth expressing, I'll comment on that company. Uh, ruleinvestmentmedia.com, list your natural resource companies. And by the way, at Rural Investment Media, you'll find information on four deep dive investment boot camps that we put on every year and our annual Natural Resources Investment Symposium in July in Boca Raton, Florida, now coming into its 30th year as the premier high net worth retail natural resources investment conference on the planet. I'm still waiting for my invite to the conference in Boca Raton. Invited, you're my guest. Well, once again, Rick, thanks very much. A pleasure. Thank you. Hi, Jonathan. Thank you very much for joining us today. The last time we spoke at the WNA Symposium in London, uranium was trading around $60 a pound. And here we are now, it's over $100 a pound. Did you think that was going to be the case? Thanks, Jimmy. Yeah, good to see you again. Uh, what a difference a few months makes. Huh? This market is, is, is surprising us in many ways, uh, myself included. I don't think uh, too many people... Uh, we're expecting uh, $100 or higher this quickly. Uh, you know, the reality is that there's been a few additional um, market developments, uh, a few surprising ones uh, in the last few months that have pushed that price higher. But uh, certainly $100, $100, you know, I didn't think, you know, that was, it's a bit of a psychological barrier that now that we've passed it, uh, you know, the market gets accustomed to that new level. Uh, but getting there in the short order, you know, roughly for four months or so was uh, a lot quicker than than I expected and many did, I think. UXC offers many different services and the primary one is price forecasting to both the uranium and nuclear industries. And this is where I want to spend our discussion is on the, the spot market. 
-hmm. And I just want to start by getting a sense of how you collect your information and who do you speak to? Yeah, so we're actually celebrating our 30th year in, uh, in business this year. So, you know, we've obviously been doing this for a while. And even before UXC was created, there was the Uranium Exchange UX, uh, which was the first uh, supplier of weekly spot uranium price data. So they were a brokerage service and had a lot of contacts throughout the industry and through their brokerage uh, collected market data and published then a weekly price. That until 1987, there was only a monthly price, if you can believe it, in this market. So uh, 1987, we started the weekly. Uh, UXC started in 1994, took over price reporting. And while we are not a broker, um, we are very uh, tied into pretty much everything that's going on in the market with uh, all the suppliers, all the traders, all the utilities. Uh, in many cases, you know, have very good relationships with them. Uh, speak uh, confidentially with many of them. Uh, you know, one thing that we do is we never name names in any of things that we publish, like, uh, you know, saying who who sold, who bought what. Uh, so people are very aware of the way we handle uh, data very, uh, very carefully. Uh, of course, there are three brokers in this market, and we talk to them and see what they are posting as well. So our price reporting really runs the gamut from broker deals, uh, direct transactions, uh, but also, uh, you know, uh, you don't have to have a transaction to publish a price. So our definition is the lowest offer of which we're aware, taking into account both bids and offers and transactions, of course. A transaction is by definition also an offer because that's where the seller is willing to sell at. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're always looking for more data and creating new relationships. There's sometimes new new traders, new funds, others that are entering the market, and we build those relationships. And through that, we make sure to collect uh, activity uh, and what they think the market is doing. But again, it's, it's uh, you know, there is no public exchange for this industry. Uh, we believe that the data we collect is the broadest based data. We actually always, every year, consistently publish the biggest volume of transactions that uh, anybody publishes. Uh, so we know of more deals going on than pretty much anyone else. Uh, you know, broker deals are a big part of this market, but maybe half of the market is not brokered. Uh, so that's direct transactions between two counterparties over the counter without anybody in between knowing about it. And often it's only us, UXC, that learns about those data points. Uh, so that's how we collect our data. Is it Perfect, probably not, but is it the best there is? I think we, I'm pretty sure it is. And just to clarify that last point you made, so a producer could phone a utility and they could transact together. Correct, yeah, I mean, look, we have utilities that often are very quiet about their activity and go to a select number of producers or traders and say, hey, I wanna buy 100,000, 200,000 pounds spot or near term. What can you show me? And you know, it could be just one entity they contact and that's who they decide to deal to the deal with. They may chop around a little bit. Uh, and that could be very quiet, done very quietly, you know, and no one else will know about it. Uh, although, you know, we'll go to a conference the next week or you know, talk to the producer of the week after and, and say, hey, any new deals? And they will share with us that kind of transaction, or the utility will share with us that they procured something. So it may not be on the spot at that moment. Um, sometimes it is, uh, but we, we generally learn about activity pretty much all the time. And when you speak to these various participants, will they tell you how much is wanted at various levels or how much is being offered at various levels? Yeah, I mean, look, um, you know, traders who are active pretty regularly uh, have a good you know, pulse of the market and, and will be able to say, hey, you know, I'm I'm seeing this offered right now, or I'm offering this, or I'm seeing this being bid. Um, brokers the same. A utility, a producer who's sort of in and out of the market less frequently, you know, they might not have as much of that knowledge. Um, you know, I speak broadly here. There are some producers that are very regular, always tracking the market, and others who are less so focused on the spot market and more interested in doing long-term contracts. So definitely, you know, the people we talk to are the ones that are in the act in the market regularly actively 
uh, at all times, but uh, we also talk to those who are less frequent, um, just that those communications may not be daily or you know minute by minute. You know, these days with um, text, uh, emails, phone, you know, it used to be all phone based. It's moved obviously into the uh, uh, the more advanced communication mechanisms, but it's still a people based industry. You know, this isn't a huge market. At any given point in time, you probably have maybe 50 to 60 parties that could be active overall in the market. So it's not huge, it's not tiny, but it's also not, you know, it's not oil, it's not gas. And so now I want to talk about the spot market and, and just try to get a sense of how tight it is. And as we mentioned at the beginning, the uranium price in September was $60 a pound. Now it's over 100. But that would indicate to me with a move like that, that the there's not much liquidity in the marketplace. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I mean, look, there have been a lot of pounds transacted in that period. So, you know, if you measure it just based on volume, it, you might argue there's been liquidity. Um, that said, have there been a lot of pounds looking for a home and no buyer? No. And what's been really uh, the trend since, yes, August, September of last year has been anytime, pretty much anytime you've seen a bid in the market, a buyer looking for uh, procuring material, They've been they've been um, met by an offer that is often some level higher than the the last trans known transaction. So the sellers are able to basically dictate what that new price should be, and bidders uh, have consistently been willing to accept that higher offer price. So that's been the driver. Uh, so from that standpoint, you know, yes, there are pounds available, uh, but the buyers have been willing and able to you know, continue to buy at higher levels. And that's what's helped to push the price up. Uh, you know, it's not huge volumes every day, every week. We've had some lulls in the market through that four or five year, five months period. But overall, uh, I can't think of a time where we didn't have anything going on in a, in a week. Um, you know, we have a few days of quiet and then all of a sudden it picks back up. Uh, but generally, as I said, I mean, that's been the trend that sellers have been able to dictate higher prices and whether it's the buyers that are you know, in need of material and just having to pay up or are buying because they believe that the price will continue to rise and therefore, you know, willing, you know, especially a trader, more of a speculative buyer may be willing to take a bet today on a higher price, thinking that they'll be able to sell at a higher price down the road. Um, again, and, and that's been happening too. With a move like this, do you get a sense that somebody might be short a lot of pounds and that's why they're taking their price up as aggressively as they are? It's always hard to judge, you know, who's short, who's long. Uh, I'd say, you know, compared to two, three years ago, traders, for example, are not sitting on material very long these days. So uh, if they have material, Either they have a place to put it already, or uh, you know, are looking to move it pretty quickly and can. Uh, utilities, there have been some, not a lot. I don't want to overhype it. I don't think utilities these days are focused on the spot market, especially at $100 plus. If they can avoid the spot market, they will. Um, that said, we have seen some utility buying in the last four or five months. Uh, and then on top of that, you know, producers who may be underproduced need to cover. You know, there's a little bit of that out there. It's also not a major factor. Um, the big one that we haven't yet touched on is the investment uh, investors, you know, the funds. Obviously, everyone knows about SPUT, Yellow Cake, but there's also hedge funds, quieter funds out there doing deals. Um, and, and, you know, I don't think that those are the types that would be short. Uh, they're just betting on, you know, the market to continue to rise. Uh, so, I, you know, I'm hard to say for sure, but I don't think that this market has a lot of folks that are short at the moment. I do think, though, that there are a lot of folks um, aware of the tightness and trying to get ahead of it or banking on it to getting even more tight down the road uh, and, you know, expecting perhaps a utility or someone who really is in a have to buy mode to come out uh, sooner and later. And at that point, you know, really can't. Um, can't say no to whatever the price is. 
So in this current environment, in, in this market as it is, is would it be possible possible to buy 250,000 pounds or 500,000 pounds? Yeah, I mean, look, most average deals are 100, 150,000 pounds. That's a sort of average size, um, and that's been consistent. Uh, once you start going into the larger volumes, uh, you know, there have been what you'd call maybe uh, bulk volume premiums as opposed to in the old days, bulk volume discounts. Um, you know, there's also a way to piecemeal it together. So if a buyer is looking for half a million pounds, they won't buy it all at once. They can take it from multiple parties and, and, and piece it together. Uh, but, you know, if you take 500,000 pounds out of this market, you're not going to, the market is going to notice that. Uh, the price is going to move up based on something that big. And we, as I said, we've seen price moving on 100,000 uh, pounds single deals uh, over the last uh, three, four months. So, yeah, I mean, look, there's not a heck of a lot extra out there uh, looking for a home. Um, that said, there's always some pockets of material available at the right price. Right, right. So just to clarify, there are sellers out there, but if you want to get any meaningful supply, you're going to have to take it higher to get it in. Generally, yeah. I mean, you might be able to get a, a couple hundred thousand pounds at today's price or even a slight discount. But if you want a, a larger volume, uh, you're not going to get to that larger volume without moving the market. So let's move on to the term market. Maybe you can give us some color as to what you're hearing there. Yeah, I mean, look, so last year was a bang, uh, you know, a much uh, very active year. Uh, we had some really big deals. Uh, the likes of Ukraine and China and some other buyers that really did big deals. Um, the U.S. market was actually quieter than I thought it would be last year, to be honest. I thought the U.S. utilities might do more last year, and compared to non-U.S. utilities, the U.S. was quiet. Um, that said, uh, you know, we did have uh, 160 million pounds overall uh, contracted for last year, which was up pretty heavily from the prior year, from 22. Uh, going into this year, it's it started out quietly, but that's not unusual. January, you know, utilities are evaluating their positions, looking at their open needs, and then uh, going to management, getting approvals, moving forward on new strategies. Obviously, the price, especially the spot price moving up quickly, has also maybe um, uh, changed some of the utilities' procurement approaches. Uh, maybe some are trying to hold back and see if they can dip into inventory instead of uh, using the market for um, coverage. That said, you know, there's still quite a bit of pounds that are needed to be purchased in the next four or five years, pre-2030. Uh, and, and then the uncovered needs post-2030 really ramp up significantly. So uh, I suspect that this year will be active. Uh, I, always hard to say. I mean, when you have a big price move, um, it's possible that you see uh, utilities take a bit of a wait and see approach for a while. Um, but, you know, by the end of the middle of the year, later in the year, uh, if they've been waiting and the market still keeps rising, I think at some point some just jump in and, and bite the bullet. Uh, and and I, I, you know, I can't imagine that you're going to have um, maybe uh, under 100 million pounds transacted at by the end of the year. I think you could have more that or more. Uh, that said, it might be, as I said, maybe a little bit more out of the U.S., but you could see a lot of markets involved. Uh, Europe has been pretty steady. Uh, Asia, you know, always good for some volume. The Chinese, I mean, we'll have to watch if they come back like they did as big last year as this year. Um, but then, you know, there's, there's, there's markets around the world that need uranium. And, uh, yeah, I think it'll be a pretty active, interesting year. Uh, so stay tuned. So you made mention of the fact that in 2023, 160 million pounds were contracted, but you don't think it's going to be that high this year. But you also mentioned that the Chinese have been very aggressive, and I can only assume they're going to continue to be very aggressive buyers. There's also lots of chatter about the Russians have been very aggressive about buying and also uh, buying pounds in the, the spot market. But when you add all this up, and then if you get the U.S. utilities involved, don't you think the prices in the term market be, could be significantly higher and also the quantities? Uh, well, it's twofold, but you know, look, I think the market, the term market is always, this happens 
when when we're going up and when we're going down. The term market is a is a slower moving market. Uh, you know, there's always a time lag between price signals and then uh, production announcements and the like, and and vice versa. So demand in the term market is 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 going to continue to be pretty steady, I think, and and could still be high. I I don't want to say for sure we're going to be below last year's number, but uh, yeah, last year was reflective of some pretty big deals that may or may not be able to be repeated this year, uh, because once once a you know 20, 30 million pounds is is contracted for, that buyer you know may have several years where they don't need to cover anything anymore. Uh, that said, you're right. The Chinese continue to be uh, growing quickly building a lot of reactors. So their, their needs will grow and their term contract, and I think will grow with it. Um, as for the price movement, look, as I'm going back to what I was saying, as far as uh, there being a delay, delayed response, the term price has risen. Uh, you know, I think we're on 68, you know, dollars as of end of last year. Uh, that's based on base escalated contracts that are signed today with escalation. So you know, the future price that's paid on that contract isn't 68, it's 68 plus three, four, five years, six years of escalation. So, you know, the the producer will realize, you know, higher prices out in time under those contracts. The other thing I make, uh, make, make a point of is that a lot more contracting these days is uh, referencing market-related pricing. And the floors and ceilings under those market-related contracts are, have come up a lot. They've been moving much quicker and moving more with the spot market. So, uh, you know, even if a term contract price looks like it's still well below a spot price, the future price that may be delivered on in, in that contract is going to be probably a blend of future market, i.e. spot price, plus that base escalated. So base price today plus escalation. So the, the, the producers will be seeing relatively higher prices out in time. Um, and, you know, utilities are aware of that, of course, and, and, and as I said, trying to balance their costs and their future costs with what their needs are. Uh, but I do think, you know, that there's always a pull in these, in these situations where the spot price moving quickly tends to then pull along the, the term price. Uh, that's already happened in, over the last couple of years. I mean, we were at sub $40 term price not too long ago. Now we're almost at 70 and it does feel like there's consistent upward pressure on that term price. Uh, so I, I suspect that as long as the spot price holds or even goes higher, the term price will move um, accordingly, just at a slower pace. Are there any meaningful RFPs being shopped? Uh, right now, it's a little bit of a slow period, as I said. Not, not too many utilities end the prior year with a new uh, tender going into... There, there are always some. Uh, uh, so, you know, I could say people that might subscribe to our newsletter might see us write up that there's three or four active tenders out there at any given time. Um, but then behind the scenes, there's always more uh, off-market negotiations that are happening. So those are harder to assess. Um, and in that sense, you know, uh, you know, you might have bilateral negotiations between a trader, I mean, a, pr a producer and a utility that take a month or two uh, to crystallize into a contract. Um, so those are also always ongoing, but um, nothing really major that I'm aware of at the moment, more, you know, the regular uh, kind of typical volumes, you know, a couple million pounds, two, three, four million pounds for, for one contract, that kind of thing. UXC also provides market analysis on conversion and enrichment services. Maybe you can give us an overview of what's happening in those two segments of the fuel cycle. Yeah, look, conversion is probably the tightest market of all three component markets right now. I mean, we've got um, good news last year in the restart of the Metropolis plant. We've seen improving operations in France, talk of expansions potentially down the road, uh, but no firm commitments yet. Uh, and in the meantime, though, you know, moving away from Russia, so that impacts the conversion space. And, uh, you know, some some suppliers like Kamek are, are almost at their maximum, you know, close to it. So, 
it's a very tight market. Uh, inventories were pulled off much quicker in conversion than in uranium. Uh, so we're seeing consistent, continued upward price pressure. We were at $46 last month. I think you know we're, we're seeing bids north of that today in the spot conversion market. And the term conversion market has also been quite active. Last year was a very active year. Uh, with utilities very concerned, I think, about the future availability of, of UF6 of conversion and contracting based on that. Uh, so the market has moved and is continuing to move where the, the term price in all three markets these days, spot is ahead of term. Uh, conversion, spot was ahead of term a lot earlier, but now term is catching up. Uh, and, and moving to the enrichment market, uh, you know, look, uh, you might want to talk next about Russia and the situation there, but quickly what, you know, what's going on obviously um, in, in the West, in US, Europe, uh, parts of Asia, moving away from Russia, no new contracting. Um, you know, that means that all the new contracting is with the few Western enrichers. Uh, we did see both Orano and Urenko make announcements last year uh, to expand capacity. And some of that was underwritten by new contracts, they said. so. Certainly, that's a sign that um, enrichment is, um, uh, you know, very active on the contracting side. But also, utilities have been taking making moves to shore up uh, future enrichment supplies. Uh, it is often the case that uh, utilities will start with enrichment and then work backwards. So enrichment tends to be the first moving uh, part of the, the fuel cycle. So uh, prices have though you know risen. Uh, not as quickly. We had a big jump right after the start of the war, uh, and then since then they've been more steady. But the spot price uh, for SWU last year did jump ahead of the term price pretty sizably, um, and that's a reflection of the lack of of SWU of inventories, you know, sort of spot availability. Uh, and I think that some utilities are starting to worry that if they lose a Russian delivery or there's a cancellation or, de or a delay. Uh, and they have to go in the spot market. Um, and, you know, the spot market is pretty dry right now when it comes to SWU. So you touched on Russia, so let's go there. And yeah. the U.S. is currently trying to pass some legislation to prevent the importation of Russian uranium and services. Is that correct? Yeah, so a bill passed uh, the U.S. House of Representatives sort of second week of December, I believe, uh, you, you know, unanimously, so both uh, parties agreed to that. That bill, H.R. 1042, basically um, implements an instant ban on Russian imports of enriched uranium, but then allows for a waiver process that uh, buyers of um, enrichment services and or enriched uranium uh, from Russia can continue to access that through the end of 2027. And there's still the same quota that we ha already have currently that's been uh, the law of the land, which is basically based on the Russian suspension agreement. So those quotas limit how much Russian enriched uranium comes in every year. Uh, and But that bill you know, continues those quotas through 27. But by 2028, those, that quota goes to zero. And there's no more legal mechanism to import Russian EUP or, or uranium product. Um, so that bill uh, did go to the Senate at the end of December, uh, and surprisingly, one senator, Ted Cruz of Texas, uh, decided that he uh, had other needs or uh, political interests from the House. So he held, he's holding that bill up uh, on his own, uh, hoping to get some other semiconductor uh, regulatory approval uh, bill passed by the House, which is his pet project. Uh, and so right now we're waiting for the Senate to move on that bill. Uh, you know, some people think it could be any day. Uh, you know, the Congress in this, these days has been quite uh, inefficient, to say the least. Uh, so you never know what's going to happen out of, out of Washington. But uh, that bill is sitting there in the Senate and could pass quite soon. Uh, I'm not going to be able to say how soon because nobody knows. Uh, but uh, there's bipartisan support for it, and I do think that it's not a question of if that bill will pass, it's more a question of when, uh, and I think that's, you know, it could be as soon as this spring or, you know, could be next week. I, I just don't know. 
So the fact that there's waivers involved and that it sounds to me like nothing's really going to change. It's going to be business as usual. It sounds like it's just more grandstanding. Do you agree with that? Well, it, so the, I mean, you're, it's to some extent, I don't disagree that, you know, the market since February 22, you know, utilities, U.S. and others have moved away from Russia. They're continuing to honor existing contracts. Is that what you do in this market? <clears throat> Some have canceled, very few, uh, but generally, you know, the market has already been pricing in and, and fa factoring in a loss of Russian enriched uranium, maybe not immediately, but down the road. What this ban does, though, is for the first time since the war, formalize that. So until now, it's been self-sanctioning. It's been, uh, you know, government sort of telling utilities don't do this anymore, that kind of thing. But this would be a formal legal ban. So there's a psychological um, effect to that that I think would be still quite important. Uh, the waiver process you just talked about is completely unknown. Uh, we do not know how the Department of Energy and the government generally is gonna implement that. It could be very onerous. It could be so difficult to implement that uh, US utilities actually do see either uh, deliveries delayed or canceled. Um, and there's this outside chance, I don't think it's high, but at the moment it's not zero, that if the U.S. ban passes in the U.S., Russia counter bans and does its own unilateral uh, just to the U.S., not the rest of the world, but says to the U.S., hey, if you're going to cut us off in 28, we'll cut you off tomorrow. And so there's that chance too. So all these things are still playing out in the market. And, uh, you know, I think some of the price run up especially after those uh, uh, congressional activities I mentioned in, in December, had a big part to play in the psychology of the market and in the price run-up that we saw after uh, sort of mid-December. Now, that's an interesting point. And when you said that, it kind of reminds me of what happened to the U.S. in the 1970s with the oil embargo. And in a very short period of time, the price of oil went from $3 a barrel up to 11 which doesn't sound like much, but that's close to 300%. And it almost sounds like the same thing could kind of happen here with enrichment and conversion services, if if Russia was to do that. Yeah, oh, if there's a unilateral ban, I think all bets are off. Um, and uh, that's not priced into the market. Let me put that, make that clear, uh, if, if that happens. Now, as I said, I think it's an outside chance. I don't think it's a, you know, definite kind of thing. I think it's it's probably still very low probability. I think Russia has reasons not to do that. They sell uranium and enrichment and reactors to countries around the world, and they don't want to be seen potentially as, you know, using that as a lever, uh, you know, political kind of cudgel that they can hurt any country with. Um, you know, it obviously is a, an option they have at any point in time. If they don't like someone, they can cut them off. Uh, but I think they would lose business down the road if they were seen as using that um, purely for political purposes. Jonathan, the WNA has reported that there are 440 nuclear reactors in operation currently. There's another 60 under construction. 26 of those are going to be coming online within the next three years. And depending on the size, they might use anywhere from 500,000 to a million pounds. Then, of course, you need additional pounds for inventory. And I guess my question to you is, we're already running at a deficit, but where are we gonna get the additional pounds for these nuclear reactors? Yeah, well, look, the near-term new ones, uh, you know, utilities are pretty smart folks and they've already procured for that. So they're not waiting to go into the spot market next year to cover for new reactor reload, you know, first cores. Um, that said, uh, you know, if we continue to see this new bill pace, either, you know, at least at the current pace or, or quicken, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of demand coming down the pike. The other factor beyond what, you know, new builds is keeping reactors online. You know, we just saw things like Diablo Canyon and Belgium uh, announce uh, extensions. We're I'm watching closely if the, the Pickering plant in, uh, in Ontario gets extended, which looks like a good chance. Uh, you know, those types of reactors tend not to have fuel pre-purchased. So in those situations, you could see a quick need uh, arise uh, for fuel. To your bigger question, will there be enough uranium? Will there be enough conversion enrichment? Um, 
you know, the market signals, the price signals, I think are all there that demand is growing and, and, and supply needs to respond. Supply response so far has been uh, tepid, I'd say. Uh, you know, we need a bigger supply response. We need more mines. We need more converters. We need more enrichment plants. All of that has to happen. And it has to happen now in a pretty short order. I think uh, by 2030, uh, you know, we could see huge supply gaps forming. Um, you know, even with Russia continuing to supply, like, you know, you mentioned. So uh, I believe there are obvious signals being sent by the market right now. The reason the price is so high is that we need to see uh, new production, new production capacity come online. Um, I'm hopeful that this year is going to be the year that we see, especially some, some new mining decisions. We've seen a few small ones, uh, which are good. Uh, some, you know, idle capacity coming back. But uh, there's going to be a lot of uranium needed, new uranium needed in the next uh, 10 years and further. Uh, and so far, I'm, I'm not seeing it all. So, uh, but let me, let me close with a, a hopeful statement. I mean, look, while the market is tight and we have a lot of uh, supply concerns, I mean, it's great that we're talking about 60 new reactors and, and hopefully a lot more. Um, you know, whether it's climate change, energy security, you name it, we need these nuclear plants. Uh, and, uh, you know, it would be a real shame if this, this resurgence, this new growth in nuclear power were stymied just because we don't have the fuel for it. So I'm pretty sure that the industry will rise to the occasion and we'll have that fuel when we need it. Uh, but a lot of hard work has to be done and it has to be done soon to make sure that all that fuel comes online soon and, and, and supports that, that growing reactor fleet that we all want to see. Jonathan, that was a great update, and I want to thank you for spending time with us today. If someone would like to learn more about UXC and its various services, where can they go? Uh, UXC.com. It's as simple as that. Uh, you can see it behind me here. Um, you know, look, we we cater to the entire world. Uh, we're a global market uh, industry data provider. Happy to uh, entertain any inquiries at any point in time. Uh, all our information is is on our website. Um, appreciate you, Jimmy, the opportunity to introduce the company if people don't, haven't heard of us. Uh, but if you've been around Uranium, I think you may have, but uh, definitely happy to discuss uh, more with anyone that's interested and uh, wants to learn more about our products and services. Well, that's great. Thank you very much. And I look forward to our next discussion. Great. Thanks. Take care. Hi, Dustin. Thank you very much for joining us today. How are things in Astana? Hello, James. All is well in Astana. Thank you. And I know you're in the middle of winter there. How's the weather? It was actually, the weather is actually nice today. It's minus one in the morning. It was minus 12 last night and we expect it to be minus 25 tomorrow. Minus 25, that is frigid. Yeah, it's quite volatile here. But that's actually, that's the typical weather here. That should be minus 25, so this minus one, minus 12 drops are uh, something. Out so if line. I come to visit, if I come to visit, I should come in the spring. You should come in the spring, yeah. You can come now, actually. Uh, like we'll take care of you, but in general, if you're allergic to cold, you should uh, wait for the spring to come. So let's move on now and discuss what's happening at Kazataprom. It is the world's largest producer of uranium, producing approximately 22% of global production. So any change coming out of Kazataprom has an impact on global markets. And Kazataprom recently announced that the production numbers for 2024 will be lower than expected. And why don't we just start right here and take us through the reasons for this production adjustment. Yeah, sure. Thank you for your question, James. Uh, I may say like uh, very common things as I like make, make common sense, but still, just given the present geopolitical realm and uh, all the things that happening, the unraveling of the situation, uranium production is associated with many risks. And the recent set of global events demonstrated that the disruptions of supply chain remains a major issue for uh, all industries and that I'm from is no stranger. Uh, throughout all our official communications in 2023, we reiterated that sulfuric acid 
that access to sulfuric acid is an issue that uh, still remains on the table and uh, we're exposed to this risk. We've been uh, actively pursuing uh, sulfuric acid uh, supplies and, uh, starting from uh, quarter three of 2023. Our production team uh, was pursuing this task actively, doing their best in order to secure the required quantities. We've said that uh, hitting our production target in 2024 may be a challenge, and we'll pro provide the exact figures in uh, trading update that's supposed to be released. That's supposed to be released on February 1st of 2024. However, I would like to address this issue and uh, declare here, like officially, that uh, the major and the only reason behind our possible production uh, drawback is an access to sulfuric acid, not the depletion of our minds and all these rumors that are being spread on uh, social media with regards to like our situation with minds. No, that's a very good point. And so I just want to clarify one thing that you said. So it has nothing to do with depletion rates. It's only because you can't secure enough sulfuric acid. Exactly. Just uh, like I'll, I'll give you more color on that, actually. As the S&P Global Commodities Agency reports, uh, sulfuric acid, uh, like 60% of worldwide sulfuric acid consumption, is utilized for uh, production of fertilizers. And fertilizer, as you can imagine, this is associated with the security of food supply. And uh, here in Kazakhstan as well, this is the issue. And uh, food supplies are all, like, always being prioritized. So we have to compete with the uh, consumers of sulfuric acid who are dealing uh, in or like operating in the food industry. And uh, in general, uh, the procurement of sulfuric acid is not that straightforward. There are a lot of moving parts, the logistics, the access to byproduct to, from out of which the sulfuric acid is made, the capacity to produce, and uh, this is a hazard, the substance. And so in order to transport it, it's also a challenge as well. And uh, I've seen like, we've seen a lot of rumors going around, like in, in not even rumors, accusations uh, saying that uh, we underestimated the depletion rate of our minds in all these things. And uh, my genuine advice would be to seek uh, advice, like to seek advice from uh, acclaimed and uh, reputable industry expert, geology experts. Let's say, for, for example, SRK Consulting. They did the job report. It's available on our site where one can see the depletion rate of our mines, and that, uh, they'll be they'll go depleted like well beyond 2050. And uh, one other thing that uh, we report uh, to our uh, state body, state authorities, with regards to the depletion rate of our mines, the availability of uranium in the ground, and uh, the state authorities here in Kazakhstan, the Ministry of Energy, they report this information to IAEA as well. So, I mean, we're, uh, we're covered from a lot of... Uh, uh, agencies and sites with regards to our uh, resource base. So all these accusations are uh, somewhat absurd. And Dustin, maybe you can just speak to how the decreased production will affect sales and also your financial performance at Kazata Prom. Yeah, thank you for this question as well. Well, the production drop will not affect our existing commitments. We remain committed to fulfilling all our uh, existing obligations toward all existing customers. However, it may affect our inventory levels, and uh, this will be a small challenge, but it's not going to affect our operations in terms of sales. Uh, as of first half of 2023, we had uh, roughly 8,000 tons of inventory levels. This may drop. In terms of our financial performance, uh, well, you can see the sensitivity table of Kazatom Prom and our exposure to spot prices, and that will uh, speak for this will speak for for itself because uh, we're doing better than uh, the exposure to spot price actually enables us to perform better than some of our uh, major industry peers. And so I want to clarify one point. So you said you did have 8,000 tons worth of inventory. And um, 
is that a normal number or is that more or less or maybe you can put that into perspective for us well that's a typical number and uh, in terms of uh, to give you a perspective this number is bigger than what niger produces and niger accounts for five percent of worldwide production it's actually uh, yes and this figure may decrease as i've said due to should this actually should this production shortfall happen but uh, uh, this is also one uh, one of the issues i'd like to iterate that uh, our sales and our obligations and uh, to our clients are not going to be affected And just a follow-up question, because Adaprom also has a number of JV partners. How will the lower production numbers impact your partners and, by extension, global markets? Uh, yeah, this is the, the risk and the impact that is going to be shared by everyone. It's Kazatomprom, not only by Kazatomprom, and uh, so should the, the production shortfall actually occur there will be less uranium coming from Kazakhstan in general, not only Kazakhstan from. This will affect our JV partners from Canada, France, Japan, China, and Russia. Dustin, you have a first-hand look into the global market, so I'm curious to hear your views on the current market environment, both in the spot market and the term market. Yeah, we live in a very interesting time. And uh, in comparison to 2022, 2021, actually, when the uranium, when the upward pressure on uranium prices was uh, placed by Sprott Uranium Trust Fund, right now the market itself is driven forward by fundamentals. Whereas we can see the widening gap between supply and demand is the interplay and in supply and demand and dynamics, and uh, this time is actually fundamental. Everyone speaks uh, of a structural deficit of uranium that's going to happen. Uh, that's actually go that's going to be significant uh, starting from the next decade. And right now we're, we're observing all these signs that this is going to happen. This is happening right now. Let's discuss your sales strategy. In the past, your strategy was one of value over volume. Is this still the case? Yes, because that Atomprom remains to our uh, value over volume strategy. Uh, we pursue end users, utilities, and uh, geographical diversity. One can see our uh, breakdown, regional sales breakdown, and uh, like we're just we're, we're uh, trying to distribute evenly across all regions and to sell to everyone. We discriminate against no one, and uh, we like to hold talks with everyone interested in uh, our product. And are you able to give a breakdown between how much is sold in Asia versus Europe versus North America? Yeah, well, yeah, for 2022, let's say it was uh, 26 Europe, 28 America, and 46% uh, percentage-wise, and 46 China, and Asia, actually not China, Asia, but uh you can see the construction rate of uh, new nuclear power plants in asia and uh, it's safe to say that uh, it could have consumed our entire production but we're uh, trying to diversify our sales by regions so everyone has access to Kazakh uranium so to feed all this demand, a big part of your growth strategy is based on exploration. And, and maybe we can just touch on that now and how your exploration plans will help meet future client obligations. Oh, yeah. Thank you for this question as well. As I've said, uh, the structural deficit of uranium is happening and we're well aware of that. And because uh, Atomprom tries to maintain its role as a reliable and competent supplier of established supplier of natural uranium we even though we prioritize our market-based approach uh, we're doing we're implementing new exploration program in order to secure new mines we have uh, in kai two and three east Jalpak and then east moinkum at the developed stage already and uh, kazatom prom in general has uh, access to second largest uh, uranium resource base in the world 
over 800,000 tons of natural uranium. And uh, we as a national operator have a unique and priority access uh, to this resource base. This is a very complicated process in terms of the like, complex and uh, hard process in, in terms of constructing new mines, wells, and uh, establishing the infrastructure. But uh, this is you know, on our schedule, and we're doing everything in terms in, in, in order to address the emerging energy needs across the world. So another very important element besides production is also the transportation of uranium. And so I want to ask about this now. Are you still transporting material through St. Petersburg? And have there been any issues with that? And maybe you can also touch on the Trans-Caspian route. Yeah, the, the St. Petersburg route is functioning well. There are no problems associated with it, and the Transcaspian as well. Both routes are open, and both routes are uh, used, uh, utilized by Kazatomprom. But in 2023, uh, over 60% of our shipments to Western countries were carried out through Transcaspian route. Almost 70%. And uh, I've also seen uh, accusations that Transcaspian route is uh, very expensive and uh, it's economically unfeasible. Well, this is also an absurd uh, accusation because one can you know, just open our financial statements and see our transportation costs and the figures, they speak for themselves. Destin, as we wrap up, Kazataprom will be releasing its trading report here in the coming days. And what other details might we expect to see in that report well we'll give our uh, production guidance for the upcoming year uh, once we have more clarity because uh, as i've said this is not a straightforward process in terms of securing supply of uh, needed reagents and this is happening right now and can we expect the announcement of any large contracts this uh, certainly may happen, and uh, as the saying goes, let's uh, cross that bridge once we get there. Before I let you go, I have to mention the fact that the World Nuclear Fuel Cycle Conference is being held in Kazakhstan this year. Maybe you can provide some further detail on that. Oh, yeah. Uh, we're very excited about that. In fact, uh, as you know, World Nuclear Fuel Cycle Conference is a joint event between uh, World Nuclear Association and Nuclear Energy Institute. And for the first time, an event of such scale, uh, industry-wise, uh, is held in Almaty. It's our former capital, the biggest city in Kazakhstan. And, uh, it was actually included in the top 50 places to visit in 2024 by New York Times. So we're happy to welcome everyone there. And what's the weather going to be like in April? It's going to be splendid. How much in the spring? So it's an unforgettable experience. Maybe I should make the trip. Definitely, James. You should come. We'll be happy to accommodate you. Well, Dustin, I want to thank you very much for making the time today and providing some insights into the latest press release. And I look forward to our next conversation. Likewise, James. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure. Well, that concludes our conference, and I want to thank everyone for taking the time to be with us today. We have some amazing conferences coming up in the coming weeks, so please subscribe to the channel and hit that notification button to be kept up to date on future events. Once again, thank you for your support.